Che. How are you, Kalipi? Yeah, Pido. Okay, Chaperson. I was checking the other committee members. Where are they? Okay. See, Adeva is here. Adeva is also here now. Okay, Che. It was only yourself and I visit. Um, Bring a uh, Hornevant. My entire brigade was not yet here in Kalip. Oh, Mom Kizzy's years when? Yes. And Hade, we can start now. It's okay. You want me to start, isn't it, Mkalip? Yes, Jefferson. Yes, Jefferson. Yeah, I'm starting hey, the meeting. Hey, seven, seven, Jay. Yeah, I know it's seven. We are starting. I was making sure that everybody gets into the meeting, like I always do, even for yourself. I check where you are first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Yes, we, we, we are starting. Let me take this opportunity to welcome the minister. She's here in our midst. Also Thank welcome you, the team from the AG. DG of TCOC is here together with the CEO of NISA and the entire senior management team from both the department and MISA, they are here. Uh, the team from the AG is led by Mtoko. I see Cassie is here, Peggy is here, Stephanie is here. These are the colleagues from the AG, including uh, Marco, she's also here. So the members, for the purpose of record, uh, it's you, Honorable Mkalipu, Siye, Hadewe, Lutuli, Brink, Direko, Mpumza, Kornevald, Kawa, Nchava. Yes. So we do correct to proceed with this meeting. And the apology that I have is for DM Dao still busy with the shortlisting processes in the department. Also, DM Wapela has sent a written apology as well. Those are the apologies that I'm having. Uh, is attending. Uh, DM Wapela is it's Monday today. It's, no, it's not Monday, it's Tuesday. He's attending to some organizational matters that made him committed. The minister is here, the DG is here, the CEO of MISA is here. So this meeting is then ready to proceed. This is how we are going to deal with these matters. The AG will make a presentation, then we'll discuss it from half past seven up to quarter past eight. We'll be discussing uh, the, the report by the AG, then quarter past eight to 25 to the department will present. Then 25 to, to 5 to 9, MISA will present. 5 to 9 up to 5 to 10. We'll be deliberating on the two presentations. And then we are going to close this meeting at 10. Uh, then there is an apology from the CEO. He was here in the meeting, but now he's telling me, I've just got his SMS now. That's what is preoccupying me. That he got, he just received sad news of the passing away of his father in law due to COVID-19 complication. So he's gonna be flying to back home. His flight is 10 to eight. So he have tasked with Tamatada to present the MISA report supported by the CFO and the two DDGs. So it means uh, he's gonna log out at 20 past as he's gonna be boarding the flight, but he's with us here in the, in the system. That's basically the apology that I'm having. Our heart felt, felt condolences to you, uh, CEO Vimba, CEO of MIS. Uh, Minister, I felt there are these issues that we need to first deal with. Uh, before the AG then make their presentation. We are all aware that we've already dealt with some of the key issues at DCOC and MISA at our meeting that we held on the 20th of October, where we, we considered the 
quarterly performance reports of the department and MISA itself. The report were also inclusive of the four quarters for the financial year ending 31st March 2020. And then with regard to the department, we noted that the majority of the programs had spent almost 100% of the allocated budget, but there was no 100% achievement of the predetermined objectives. You, when you go through your annual report as well, it also indicates that overall program expenditure amounted to 96.2%, but the overall service delivery performance was 62%. The reported service delivery performance therefore does not match the reported spending on the allocated budget. And then when you continue to browse the annual report, you see the three programs that contributed to the underperformance were the administration program, which achieved 0%, but they spent 98.6% of the allocated budget. Then the regional and urban development and support program, it achieved 33% of the targets, but spent 99% point eight percent of the budget while the community work program achieved 40 percent of the targets and spend 98.5 percent of the budget uh, then uh, the by now uh, the colleagues from the department they now know or oh, the strong exception that committee has taken against the gross wastage of the funds through the CWP program and against uh, the lack of consequences for the perpetrators. It also came out strongly in our meeting last week, Friday, where we, we undertook to find space into this agenda to follow up on the matters as raised by the AG. Then when you, you look at the ministers forward in the annual report, the minister agrees that there are challenges with the current form of the CWP delivery model. Uh, the the minister, minister has also said on previous occasion, said that on previous occasion and the DG's presentation on Friday recited these challenges further. However, the committee has, had, has been hearing these challenges and then as members have clearly articulated in the previous session, it's now time for decisive action to correct this problem. You also look at the poor performance recorded under program two, which is also worrisome considering the department's envisions the program as the vehicle for the implementation of the district development model. Then you ask a question whether the program will be equal to the task given the absence of these dedicated personnel owing to the outstanding vacancies in the position of the DDG. The meeting of the 20th of October also had a robust discussion regarding the 3.3 billion under expenditure in respect of the local government share under the Institutional Development Program. At the time, the department's answers on how it will intend to capacitate the municipality to comply with the condition of the DORA were not satisfactory. It seems that there was no plan other than to withhold the equitable share from the municipalities irrespective of the service delivery consequence of such action. At MISA, we also noted the attainment of a clean audit for the second consecutive year. And we want to congratulate you, CEO and team, on the job well done. We also raised some concerns, particular around the serious human resource constraints, which risk rendering MISA ineffective. We look at the budget allocation to MISA which was also decreasing over the medium term and yet 
its organizational structure has undergone revision to accommodate more employees. On this point, we felt that the department was not forthcoming in terms of a concrete plan that responds to the financial pressures arising from the repositioning of MISA. And then you look at the minister's forward on the MISA annual report. The minister alludes to the need for expanding the role of MISA to accommodate the increasingly high demand for technical support from municipalities, as well as the need for MISA to assume an implementing role in certain municipalities that lack the internal capacity to deliver and manage infrastructure. However, you don't get specifics as to the particular initiative the department has implemented or intent implementing to capacitate MISA, except to recommend that MISA should drive the mobilization of additional funding from private sector financiers. There has been a considerable growth in the human resource contingent of MISA during the period under review due to the upward revision of the entity's organizational structure. This growth has seen an increase in spending of allocated budget, which has risen from 83% in 2018 19 to 93% in 2019 20. However, we should raise this as a concern that this growth in spending has coincided with a significant reduction in performance, as the entity itself has achieved 79% of its annual performance targets compared to the 91% in the previous year, 2018-19. There cannot be a strong case for funding MISA if there are no concomitant demonstration of a strong service delivery performance. So these are some of the issues that as and when the team led by um, Tom, from the AG will also have to deal with in their presentation. I should think, colleague, you got the presentation from the AG. I'm normally told that um, you have the sharing rights as presenters. Can I hand over to you, Mto, so that you start with the presentation, then we'll see how to then progress. Over to you, Mto. Um, thank you, Chairperson. I was trying to see if I can get, hopefully I will get this sorted. Okay, whilst it's sorting out, I don't know. Um, thank you, Chairperson and, and the members and honorable members. Also, um, greetings to the minister and the officials from the department and those that are part of entities and part of this call as well. Chair, I am here with my, with the team from the AGS and with my colleagues. I've got, there are five um, team members that would have been part of the COCTA portfolio, audit portfolio. Um, I've got Ukasi Kuga, Stephanie Vaitaman, as he indicated, Makopoi Graphics, Peggy Laga, and also Winston Pillay as well, who are part of, of, of this call. Chair, as we did yesterday, Ukasi Kuga is going to take us through or take the committee through the presentation or the audit outcomes of the COCTA group, which is uh, DCOC, DTA, SALGA, MISA, MDB, and CRN. However, the focus of this presentation or the outcomes that is going to focus mainly on um, DCOC, which uh, obviously moved from a disclaimer to a qualification, a, which is a significant and noticeable improvement. And the rest of 
the OTTs, we're not going to pay so much attention to the OTTs purely because the audit outcomes would have remained relatively the same um, with financially unqualified with no findings for all of them except for CRL, which would have stagnated into the financially unqualified with findings. Um, in the interest of time, I, I take note, Chair, that we've got up to uh, quarter past eight to do the presentation and also questions. We are going to try, Chair, and to be succinct, uh, but trying to cover the core of what the audit outcomes are about. Without wasting time, Chair, I will hand over to Gassi Kruger just to take us through the audit outcomes. Hopefully, I don't see the presentation. I'm hoping that it will pull through soon. Good afternoon, Chair and members. Thank you, Mtoko. Um, good afternoon to the Minister also and the Department. Um, welcome to all of you. Um, I will share the presentation here now. Clicking on it. Thank you, members. Um, can any can everyone see? Um, che, are you able to see the screen? Yes, Share. we can. Can I play with Muto to mute his microphone, please? Muto? Yes, proceed, Kasi. Thank you, Chair. Um, and members, um, okay, so um, we're not going to waste time in the interest of um, the, the limited time we have. So I'll just touch on our, on our main areas. So then just to refresh the, um, the, the committees um, and, and just to make them understand what, what the colors and things in our audit presentation will be, this will be the summary of all six, um, seven audits actually within the portfolio. Um, then we have the green for unqualified with no findings. We have the yellow for unqualified with findings. Um, then we have qualified purple, and then we have a pinkish purple for adverse and a red for disclaimer and a blue for outstanding. I think what is more important is the arrows that we indicate here, which, which, which is green for improvement and a yellow for unchanged and a red for regressed. This is normally a comparison uh, between our prior period to our current period and the movement that we've seen um, as compared to the comparatives. Then um, moving along immediately, we'll go to the audit outcomes. So as we see, um, COCTA has improved in the current year from a disclaimer of opinion to a, to a qualified. Um, in general, the portfolio as a whole remains the same um, as MISA, Salgan, MDB and DTA still maintain their unqualified audits. Um, CRL still had um, findings on um, non-compliance, which um, unfortunately withhold them from having a clean audit. But I think the main focus is that we've moved um, from two prior periods of disclaimer to a qualified opinion on, on COCTA, and that is definitely um, um, an improvement which is, which is noticeable. Then the question then becomes, um, what is the overall driver that's improved um, COCTA? And from the auditor's point of view, um, there's been active engagement by clients on, on, on COCTA and on the findings that, that the auditors raised and the recommendations that we put forward um, has been taken seriously. And then there was also from our side a um, heightened um, urgency from the department side to not have limitations and not tolerate limitations. So that has also added to the uh, auditing process being a bit more um, extended and a bit longer and cumbersome, but it has shown 
that it has yielded the, some results. So limitations were addressed adequately and then um, some um, implementation of action plan initiatives has also added to the improvement. Um, then I think the key reflections on the audit outcome um, for DCOC and CRL, which was predominantly the ones that are not completely clean within the portfolio, is that um, the corrective actions on the prior period areas that was qualified, which is now added also to the reduction in the areas of qualification, which ultimately resulted in a um, movement from a disclaimer to a qualification was also um, the addressing of the accruals and payables issue, which we've had for uh, some years now, as well as the correction of the irregular expenditure completeness. Then when we look at the material findings on performance, we will get to that slide, but there's been a significant improvement in performance information. Um, but it should also just be noted by the committee, and I think this is not applicable only to COCTA and the portfolio, this is applicable to all AG audits. Due to the COVID um, limitations that we've all experienced in the lockdown, the AG had to reduce the scope in terms of auditing of performance information. So we limited the auditing where it would have been historically um, more um, applicable to the programs which drives the mandate of each entity or department. It was now limited to one program. Um, the reason I'm just highlighting this is that even though you see a improvement in the current year, there's a potential that the picture could look different in the next financial year when the scope, full scope, when the full scope resumes. And then um, we still had material misstatements on the financial statements of COCTA. We, we saw that supporting schedules were not tying to the financial statements and this resulted in misstatements as well as non-adherence to supply chain management processes. And then again, also um, we had material non-compliances on the application of um, laws and regulations, especially relating to the supply chain process. Then just as an important point of note, um, I don't know if the committee would recall this um, and share the, the appointment of the MPOs was, was a bit problematic in the two years back when, when they were appointed um, in terms of this transfer model. And then we, it created an issue with um, the accounting, which was in terms of Circular 21 by the Treasury required to be goods and services as the department remains the custodian of the assets and um, they ultimately pay these um, principal or agents that they have, which is now the MPOs. So Treasury then gave them the departure um, which is effective until the end of the contract, 31 March 2021, which is just around the corner next year. So why we we just reiterating this fact is that the department has not incurred any regular expenditure or non-compliance relating to these MPOs. So um, depending on the restructuring of this program or the continuing in the way that the department would deem they would want to continue, um, we just need to take cognizance and, and note that if this is not addressed um, by 21 March 2021, this departure will come to an end and the department will start incurring uh, fully regular in terms of any payments made on this contract. Then um, for COCTA, another specific focus area was in terms of the current um, audit cycle, we still had instability within the leadership. However, um, towards the end of the financial year, the position of the DG was filled with an acting position which expires, um, I believe it was January next year, but um, but the head of finance was filled and we've also seen a new accounting officer and then effective from 1 November, the CFO, a new CFO was appointed. However, um, from the auditor's perspective, we really would want to see um, stability within the CWP program, dependent on, on whatever course of action the department takes in terms of this program, be it now remaining as in its current form or moving to another entity or a transfer, but um, we just want to see stability. Then um, just to also reiterate that we have seen impact in terms of the new appointments, but um, it was all towards the end of the financial year. I mean, the new um, accounting 
officer was only appointed from the 1st of May. So the financial year end had already come on to an end. So the impact is, is, is limited, but, but, but not negligible. So we believe that the real impact will, will form and we will be able to see that within the next financial cycle, um, which, which in, they would have um, a full financial year in which to apply themselves to their positions. Then um, on CRL, just to touch on the areas of non-compliance and what we believe still um, um, contributes to, to, to CRL's um, non-achieving non of their clean audit is basically slow implementation of their action plans um, and then also the repeat findings that we're identifying in terms of supply chain management. Um, then um, chair and members, um, the three areas of the financial statements would be the three areas that we actually give an opinion on in the audit report. So the first one is our credible and the financial statements. We've um, submission of financial statements in the legislative date that basically moved to green. That's because um, historically Cocteau used to submit late, even though we had extension on all audits um, within the cycle, all the audits within the portfolio submitted within the legislative date, which is, which is, which is memorable. Um, then in terms of audits that didn't have any adjustments re required in terms of the financial reporting, it was DTA, Salga, MISA, and MDB. Um, the two that CRL had um, achieved their unqualified audit opinion because of the corrections that they made within their financial statements. So they still do have uh, problems in terms of material misstatements within their financial statements. However, they have corrected it. Um, Cocta unfortunately could not correct all of their uh, material misstatements, so they've remained then in their qualification area. And the three areas of qualification predominantly prevalent within Cocta um, is the goods and services, which predominantly um, exists out of or is, 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 is what's the word? Um, well, it's, it, it's made up out of the CWP project management, which is also a material regularity that we will talk to, um, and then also the CWP participants. But it should be noted that in the prior period, we had severe limitations in terms of the participant auditing, where we would auditing of our occurrence. It was difficult for us um, as we experienced limitations in terms of participant verification, as well as timesheet submission, um, and as well as testing from the floor, the completeness of participants to ensure that they were paid. However, in the current financial year, um, the only limitation we, was, we sat with at the end was due to non that we couldn't visit sites. And that was also, that was because of the um, COVID and the site readiness. And, and, and even though we extended the aid audit later, um, sites were still not ready as PPE and uh, were not on site. And, and we do know that participants were scared and, and which is all understandable um, excuses. So at this point in time, we didn't have to go with a limitation on the completeness of the uh, participant auditing, but uh, we've stated that in the audit report that this is predominantly due to COVID. Then um, the other area was the movable tangible capital assets, which is definitely an area of concern. Um, and this is something that I think that we think the department would really have to give attention to um, out of a practical point of view as well, that we're sitting with about 4,000 subsites across the country that is managed by one head office. Um, and all of these sites have assets that have to be, you know, kept safe and administered, you know, in terms of additions and disposals. So we would not receive any um, asset register submission for the current financial year. So um, that is definitely a, a, a worrisome area. Then the last qualification area for, for COCTA was the prepayments and advances. And this is all ties in with the whole way in which the contract was um, entered into with the implementing agents or the MPOs. So they had to go with this type of hybrid arrangement where um, the suspense or the prepayment is paid to the implementing agents. And then the implementing agents provide the department with the invoices for how the money was spent. So the problem that we sit with at year end is that the prepayment is still not completely cleaned, cleared out, even though the prior period uh, prepayment, which was previously raised in last year, was cleared out significantly with the exception of about 12 million. 
but in the current year, um, the advances paid to the implementing agents were, were, were somewhat cleared, but at year end, we were sitting still with about an amount of 200 million outstanding to be cleared. So that is an issue for us as the auditors, as we cannot confirm the accuracy and the, um, and the existence of that amount at year end, as the amount has gone out, but we've not seen the, the, the supporting evidence to support the amount. Then we can move on then for performance information. Um, I will move on quicker on these ones. I think there was an improvement as stated earlier on the performance information due to the scope reduction probably as well, but it's still nonetheless good where we've seen that all of the audits within the portfolio um, achieved um, was, was had no material misstatements after the corrections. CRL, DTA and COCTA unfortunately still had to make corrections to their performance um, uh, report, but um, after that, we, we've seen that it has improved. Then um, compliance legislation, I think this has also been addressed, I've spoken about it a bit earlier, but CRL and COCTA are the ones where we are still seeing um, non-compliance. And the specific areas of non-compliance that we're sitting with on COCTA and CRL there at the top is the quality of the financial statements, where there's still uh, material misstatements within the financials, then as well as we're seeing um, procurement and contract management non-compliance, um, the prevention of irregular, fruitless and wasteful at COCTA, we're still incurring fruitless and wasteful and irregular, um, though it been to a lesser magnitude as previously due to the departure, but it is still happening. Then um, consequence management, we would want to, we're not seeing the relevant investigations into irregular and fruitless, and then uh, coupled that with the adequate consequence um, for the transgressions. Then under expenditure management, we're still identifying non-compliance with Treasury Regulation 8.1.1, where the controls are not in place in terms of payments. This is predominantly prevalent in terms of the CWP program and the prepayments, as well as we are still identifying 30-day payments um, that are not being made within the required 30 days to suppliers. Then, um, Chair and members, the preventative controls, I think it's not new. It's something that we as the AG believe that if the correct preventative controls um, and measures are designed and implemented, um, it, will, it, would, it would significantly assist in the reduction of, of errors and, and misstatements and non-compliance areas within the financial statements as a whole. So we believe a strong control environment um, will then also, um, they should and should then be given by senior management accounting officer or then the authority and then internal audit when, when, when the strong control environment is, is implemented. So what we've done is we've said here that fundamentals for strong preventative controls um, there's examples of the areas we believe these things should be prevalent. So we've given some examples here to demonstrate where and what type of, of, of type of preventative control should be put in place and predominantly focusing on uh, the CWP program. So we would just say that where there's a culture of ethical behavior and commitment by leadership, um, there should be a plan, a procurement plan um, to address um, uh, 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 the needs before you even sign your contract with your implementing agents. Um, and then under adequate skills um, of officials under the second block, we said, well, if you have um, people that you employ that with empowered um, means, so if they have the skills, the resources, the effective policies and procedures, it, it will enable them to manage and monitor the program better. Um, and this is definitely adequately where we've seen this type of implementation within SALGA, MISA, and MDB, where um, they have appropriately skilled individuals, as well as a manager management that, by our assessment, is ethical. Then if you look at comprehensive policies and procedures, it is important that senior management develop these procedures to empower the employees um, to be able to manage um, effectively, for example, the CWP program. Um, and then if we look at the fifth block under the regular risk assessment, 
we would want to see the type of we management would, would, would incorporate all the action plans of issues, which would then ultimately prevent non-compliance from taking place. Um, and then as a last comment, the combined assurance where the audit committee will be uh, should um, influence and monitor the comprehensive audit action plan um, and the audit action plan, which would then also assist in effectiveness of um, internal controls. So then we can move along, uh, members and chair. Um, the status of internal controls, I think this is quite self-explanatory still. We obviously, when you have findings reoccurring on COCTA, those areas will still be read until um, those findings are not occurring because the findings indicate a weakness in internal control, um, as well as the same situation under the risk management for CRL, <clears throat> where we still have the issues on supply chain and then, as we said, some material statements that had to be adjusted in the financial statements. Then um, under the key drivers for the internal control um, chair and members, we still see, as I indicated for COCTA specifically, this is more relevant to the COCTA, um, the material statements that are identified um, within the financial statements, um, where we said that the schedules are not, are not, are not tying adequately um, to the financial statements. And, and we believe that in order to address this, um, we would want to see um, schedules being reviewed properly, um, regularly, and that the process of drafting schedules to support financial statements should happen on a quarterly basis, where when you move towards your final financial statements, it would just be a roll forward of your information, and it would not be a scrambling to um, try and compile these schedules to support your financial statements. Um, and then we've also seen that within the second bullet point where there's inadequate controls over the um, compliance with, with, with supply chain management, um, we think that what can assist in this is that the officials that are responsible for initializing the purchasing of goods and services within supply chain should be adequately trained so that they understand um, what is expected and, and how to comply with all legislations of government. And then as well as the reviewers um, should look at the compiled work and documents adequately and in detail so that it prevents the reoccurrence or it picks up on these non-compliances so it can be addressed adequately. Then, um, Based on our previous discussion with the portfolio and the, and the presentation that we made, the previous action plan we've, we've since in the beginning of the year, we've, we've assessed the action plan that was put forward by the department. And in principle, it, though it was still quite high level, <coughs> apologies, <coughs> we did not, um, we believed it to, to adequately address the areas of concern. But what was, still lacking in the current audit cycle was the, the rate at which implementation was taking. There was still a uh, slow um, progress as well as um, limited addressing of the key issues that are actually still um, affecting the department and giving it its, its unfavorable audit outcome. Um, and then also the last bullet point is the lack of adequate record keeping, which I think has also now been addressed in the in the in the top bullets. I've basically touched on on, on record keeping in general. <clears throat> then um, we can move along. Um, for assurance providers on on our audits within the portfolio, it doesn't look bad. Um, it's just basically the senior manager and accounting officer for COCTA, where 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 obviously this also all ties in to with the areas of qualification and the control deficiencies that we are identifying within the department that need to be addressed. However, overall for the portfolio, there's been an improvement, um, which, which, which is, which is com commentable, which it's, it's, it's good. Um, then we can move to the financial information, the financial health of the portfolio as a whole. So for revenue management, we, we just see that the debt collection period um, has improved compared to the prior years, but even though we can see there's impaired provision on the percentage of um, accounts received, and that shows that Solgar is experiencing some 
we're not sold to them. They are experiencing collection, but uh, a limit um, difficulty, but it's, it just shows that there are some constraints by municipalities in, to, to, to settle their accounts. So, but nothing that, that we believe is, 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 is uh, concerning in the sense that it's red, but it is just something to take note of. Then in terms of asset and liability management for the portfolio, in general, they all, um, Salga, CRL, DTA, MDB, and DCOP maintained a positive net asset position. Um, with MISA, it was just a situation where we can see that they are you have a deficit in the current year, but due to the roll forward, it has um, given them the surplus. But if budget reduction continues in the future, um, MISA is either going to have to cut on their expenditure or they will start running into a net asset liability problem in the next financial years, which we cannot really um, foresee, but it's just a, a indicator that, that, that should be noted. Then in terms of expenditure management, um, the creditors payment periods improved for DTA, Salga, MDB and COCTA. Uh, we have seen though that the creditors payment period has increased for MISA and CRL. Um, as I said, it's not it's not worrisome, but we do see that there's a change in, 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 in timing. Then um, fruitless and wasteful expenditure for the portfolio as a whole. Um, we've seen an increase in fruitless and wasteful of um, 7.5 million. Out of the um, 7.5 million, um, 7 million relates mainly to the Purcell um, participants, the participants that have personal numbers and that are that are employed by the state and basically double dipping into the CWP program. So the department has gone and disclosed this as fruitless and wasteful, but we will touch on this a bit more when we get to the um, material irregularities. Apologies members for moving a bit fast on this, but I see that we are running out of time. So I just want to get through everything. Then under the regular expenditure, um, there's been a decrease in the current financial year, and that's mainly due to um, the departure, as indicated previously, the department of COCTA um, is not incurring as much irregular as they used to in the past, even though um, irregular is still concerning. I think any irregular is not um, ideal what we would want to see. But the irregular that we've seen um, out of the 15 million for the current financial year, 11.8 um, million relates to COCTA. Um, and it's mainly due to contracts that have been extended over the period and not um, renewed or gone out on competitive bidding. And then we have 1 million from CRL and we have 2 million coming from MDB in the current financial year. Then in terms of supply chain management, I think I've spoken a lot about it. We can see an improvement as Salga in the current financial year has moved to a green that didn't have um, findings or material findings on supply chain management. So in all, in, in, in overall, the portfolio has increased. The common findings that we're still seeing within the portfolio is um, declarations that are not um, by employees or state connected by any person employed by the state. We also see contracts um, awarded where the points are being incorrectly calculated in terms of the Triple PFA Act. Um, we had an instance of published um, published details of the winning bidder were not published and the non-compliance um, in general on supply chain prescripts. Then just a quick portfolio snapshot. Um, I think this has also been discussed, but we can see that the stagnation in terms of clean audits, we still have the four entities that are clean. We have um, one with financially unqualified uh, with findings, which is CRL. Performance has, has improved, as I've stated earlier. Uh, we still have the same um, findings in terms of non-compliance, um, but we, do, we have seen an improvement in irregular where there's been less irregular um, in the current financial cycle. Then back to the root causes, um, the main root causes for CRL and COCTA's um, stack, well, slight improvement in COCTA and the stagnation in CRL is still the slow responses um, and we need improvement in, in the key control areas. 
then we said inadequate action plan, but it actually states to the, um, the need to implement um, and track the implementation of the action plan to address the misstatements and improve the internal controls and then ultimately which would result in an overall improvement of the audit outcome. Um, and then the last one that we see is also the lack of consequence management for poor performance. And I think this ties also to what we've raised under consequence management, um, where we would want to see the relevant investigation happening in terms of regular and fruitless and wasteful. Then um, just in summary, our recommendation as the Auditor General to the department, we say just continue to implement this action plan move with haste on the action plan and make sure that as much as possible of the initiatives are addressed within the action plan. And then obviously the regular review of the achievements against these action plans. Um, and then where there are shortcomings um, to report them um, to the accounting officer and the audit committee so that it can be addressed. Then um, I think if COCTA moves to preparing quarterly financial statements, it would also assist them, especially in the issue that was raised around the schedules that support the financial statements. Um, it would be a lot less cumbersome process at the end to try and get the financial statements done at year end if this is an ongoing process quarterly. Then um, just in general to strengthen and monitor the controls, especially over CWP. Then um, for the portfolio committee, um, we believe and we recommend that you still move, carry on with um, requests of the accounting office and the minister to provide you feedback on the implementation of the progress of these action plans um, at COCTA and CRO. And then also, um, which is quite important to request feedback on the implementation of the MI process and how far the actions and commitments have progressed, especially in stopping the losses um, and preventing them from reoccurring and then recouping what has been what has been lost then um thank you um members and chair i think we've come to the last part of the presentation which i believe is, is also part of the most important which is the material irregularities that we've raised at cocta in the prior financial year um, in terms of the amended um, public audit act so the first one was well, still um, the payment that was made to Sigukuni um, corporate instead of the Sigukuni district municipality. So in the current financial year, in terms of assessing, um, as, as the members might now be aware that we as the auditors, we assess it in a few fold. We look at has the loss been stopped and has the loss been recouped and has relevant action been taken by the accounting officer in terms of recouping and preventing. So in terms of this payment to Greater Sikukuni, the department is still disclosing it as a debtor and we are comfortable with that. However, um, we, we still believe that, that there is follow-up that needs to happen from the department side in terms of these investigating authorities to which it was um, reported, which were the Hawks, um, the Special Investigating, the SIU, Special Investigating Unit, as well as the the um, state attorney. But um, in terms of internal process, we are satisfied. Hello? Yes, within terms of um, internal processes, we are satisfied with the disciplinary action that the department has taken. There is still one disciplinary action outstanding, but we are, we have seen progress and we believe in terms of the auditing that we've done in the current financial year, which relate to transfers, because we're talking about big amounts here that are going out to the municipalities and we wouldn't want something of this nature to happen again. So we've been doing analytical procedures in terms of audit substantive analyticals, and we've done um, severe CATS procedures on the payments that went out to these various municipalities, um, whereas we cannot give full assurance um, as the auditors, but we are comfortable that it's free from material misstatement. Then um, the second, number two and number three, chairs and members, this is the ones that if you recall, it relates to the deceased participants. And then the third one, which ties up with the fruitless and wasteful disclosed in the current financial year, which was the payment to employees of the state, which are basically also getting paid within the CWP program. So 
these um, main commitments will follow the completion of the investigation by COCTA, um, in which this external entity will make the recommendations. We have not seen this report yet. However, we know that it is moving towards its end, um, and we would want to see it as rather sooner than later so that we can assess um, the implementation and what, what COCTA is going to do in terms of recouping the full losses from deceased and, and, and employees by the state. It should, however, be noted that within the current financial year, we're not just waiting for these investigations to be finalized. We wait, We also went and did audit work with the department and on the follow-up of this one, especially more on the deceased, we were able to be provided with a lot of information from the departments previously on previous last year um, identified and current year where we can see now that a lot of this is due to data integrity in the way that these implementing agents, uh, these uh, participants were captured on the MIS system, which also was incorrect. So for uh, some of them, not all, but for some of them, we were able to see that they were incorrectly um, captured. So we are just now in the next audit cycle, we will wrap this up and we will um, follow up with the department to make sure that the implementing agents that were incorrectly captured or now have now been corrected on the system. And then the ones that were deceased for the past financial years that we would need to see the recoupment of this loss. Um, I believe that if, if the department implements the corrective action as recommended and the commitments made by the um, accounting officer, um, number two and number three can be resolved in the next financial year. Then um, number four relates to the prepayment, which I've already actually touched on, which it also ties to the qualification on the prepayment that's not cleared. So for us as the auditors at year end, we have this balance that's lying there as a prepayment or suspense in, in essence to the implementing agents, yet the money has not come back, yet the goods has not been purchased and cleared to goods and services. So that's where the angle comes from. However, I said earlier, we've seen that the prior period was, was a lot of it was cleared, but there was still about 12 million outstanding, which re requires attention. <clears throat> and in order for us to completely resolve this, um, this prepayment issue needs to be cleared also before the contract comes to an end in March 2021. Otherwise, um, it could result in a... Um, a issuing of a of a remedial action to the accounting officer which we would want to avoid but 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 would have to be done if 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 the appropriate actions are not implemented in the next audit cycle then um, number five and number six which are the last two relates to the project management that's also part of the qualification under goods and services um chair the members um we are actually a bit concerned about Number five, especially because that relates to the prior contract. Um, this is also part of the investigation. It's been done by the external entity, and at, on, on, on completion of this investigation, the accounting officer would have to now decide what action is going to be taken against these um, implementing agents, and they need to assess the exact magnitude of for what they did receive value and for what they did not receive value in terms of um, payments that were made to these implementing agents and the portion for which they did not receive value, we would have to see a recoupment of some sort of the loss um, from these implementing agents. But the reason why this is, we still assess it as appropriate action being taken is that we have to give um, the investigating authority or entity now, in this case, the opportunity to also complete the investigation and make the corrective um, recommendations to the department. But these ones will also get our attention. We have, however, also since um, the completion of the audit, we have been informed by the um, department that, that, that this project management is getting the required um, attention it needs. Um, and that brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, thank you very much. Can I pass remove your presentation, cousin, from the screen so that the department can load theirs? I've done it. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, AG.
I shall think we can allow the department and MISA to present, to cut, to avoid a, a repetition so that a, I think it will be ideal for all the presentations to be flighted and then shared so that then we can have a interaction on both ones to avoid where we we'll go there and then the department will have to respond and then again, yeah. Can I allow the minister to do an overview on both? And then she will decide who does what then. Over to you, Minister. Thank you very much. I'll show my face, but my network is unstable. So it's terrible my, for everybody today. If you <laughs> allow me, I would. Yes. Yeah, just so switch, switch it off off because my... the network. Yes, the network is just terrible for everybody today. You Thank can you switch it off. Much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me let me thank the portfolio committee. Great everyone, and thank the presentation from the AG. But let me say that from our side. I will not take a long time other than to say, uh, when, if we look at DCOG, we really are not where we should be. But I also think that um, if we look at where we're coming from, there is some improvement. Just starting with just submitting reports because when we arrived, the reports were submitted late, both to the AG and the annual report. This time, at least we have submitted on time. And of course, uh, the AG's report you've just had. Um, as I say, we, we are not where we should be, but coming from two years of disclaimer, I think we should say that there is improvement if we can just do what the AG has said, we will slowly get to where we should be. But in terms of in, in terms of the performance generally, I, I do agree that the performance has not been good. And I think the officials um, will say explain, but um, our performance is not good. And we, the issues that the chairperson has raised, uh, I've raised myself with the accounting officer who, poor accounting officer only arrived in May, but she has to, we have to question things that happened before she came, but, um, I, I, I would just say that uh, we hope that we can improve next year in terms of both performance, but also in terms of the financial management and audit outcomes. In terms of MISA, um, yes, the audit is good, but I think what we should really try and improve is the impact on the ground of, of MISA um, and DCOC as well, because it's, it's good to have clean audits and we congratulate them for that. But I think we must try and improve the, 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 the impact on the ground. So I don't want to dwell on what has happened because it has happened, it can't be changed. But just to learn lessons from it and see how we can improve going forward. So I'd rather just leave it at that and say, let's get the presentation and then we'll 
participate in the discussion. Thank you. Did you doing the presentation? Yes, good evening. Yes, sorry. Good evening, Honorable Chairperson, and good evening to our Minister. Um, and uh, good evening to all the Honorable Members and also to all the officials that are present from all the DCOG family. Uh, the purpose of my presentation is to appraise the uh, committee on the DCOG detailed annual result, and also just to look at our financial performance. So our, we are presenting the uh, annual performance report for 2019-20, uh, and the department has also submitted the annual report for tabling. Uh, and we are also gradually, gradually advancing our strategic intent of ultimately uh, getting an unqualified um, order. If we go, go to the next slide and skip this, and then just in terms of the next slide, please. The department's vision, mission, and values. Uh, we aspire to really uh, ensure that we have service excellence for improving lives through cooperative governance. Uh, and this is what Minister was alluding to earlier. And our mission here is to lead the cooperative governance system and really just ensure that we support integrated service delivery for the betterment of everyone's life in South Africa. And just our values uh, are that of being committed to public service, showing integrity in all we do, being people centered in our approach, being professional, and just having the passion to serve and demonstrating excellence and accountability. On our next slide, in terms of our DCOG strategic objectives, we had nine of these uh, during the year under review. So I'll just take you through each one. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, just in terms of ensuring good governance and sound internal controls, uh, there were some arrangements that were made to ensure that we are stable, uh, specifically with the uh, implementation of all our structures or the operationalization of all these structures which is the top management committee, the internal control committee, audit committees, uh, and so on. We did, however, have some challenges in, in actually filling some of the uh, positions at the high level, and the AG has also uh, alluded to what these are were. And then just in terms of the municipal space um, and the, uh, sorry, the municipal space economy, We've actually also continued to support municipalities uh, to develop and integrate their, de sorry, to develop integrated development plans. Uh, and with this, we've also introduced the district development model during the period, uh, which we envisage to align to the IDPs to make up that one plan for all the districts. If you move to the next slide, uh, we talk to the inclusive economic development. Uh, and the implementation of the initiatives of the national framework of the local economic development. Uh, and here the national framework was developed for the period 2018 to 2028. If we move to the next slide, here we were looking at a strategic objective to actually deepen the relationship with our citizens. And here we had uh, some significant achievements with GovChat initiative. Uh, which actually also proved to be effective in closing our gap uh, between government and the communities. On uh, the next strategic objective, we wanted to ensure that we build a capable ethical and developmental local government. Here we continue to provide support and to monitor governance at municipalities uh, to ensure that there was compliance with the Municipal System Act regulations, especially when, it look, when we looked at conditions of employment of senior managers. Uh, on the next uh, strategic objective, we also look to promote good governance and strengthening anti-corruption. And particularly on, on this one, uh, over the past five years, we had to provide support 
uh, to the municipalities. Uh, and in that, we had then developed our anti-corruption strategy. And if you move to the next strategic objective, we had to improve our system of disaster management and fire services across. Um, and we had a number of initiatives here where we were able to actually implement uh, the recent publication of a white paper on fire services. We then moved to the next strategic objective. We had to look at the coordination and collaboration of infrastructure development. So we've continued to support municipalities to ensure that there is spend on the MIG. Uh, and this we've done in, in line with the Division of DORA, um, sorry, Division of Revenue Act or the DORA. And we've worked very closely with MISA to improve the infrastructure related matters, um, in fact, delivery on infrastructure related matters affecting the municipalities. And then the final one was just, we had a target of ensuring that we have 1 million work opportunities. However, on this one, we only achieved an average of 257,000 work opportunities for the year and uh, um, beginning, sorry, for the year as per the beginning of the MTSF. Uh, and this was due to some budgetary constraints that we had. So if you move to part A of the annual performance um, information, uh, in particular here, the first, um, the first strategic objective, uh, which we had to ensure good governance and sound internal controls um, on this one, we had to make sure that our post audit action plan uh, outcomes were actually indeed uh, implemented and we needed to ensure that we then improved our audit outcomes for the by the end of the March 2020. This was not fully achieved. Only 15% of the actions were implemented by the end of the, the financial year. So in, in relation to this, we've had 51% of our actions that were partially achieved and, and implemented and 34% were not uh, implemented. So there's been a significant decrease in the number of actions that were not implemented, uh, but we've had a dedicated audit team established to assist us in fast tracking through our IMT implementation tool. If we go to the next slide, uh, under the same program too, uh, on this performance indicator, we had to make sure that our support programs are implemented in the selected intermediate cities. Um, and what, in particular, we had um, targeted four intermediate cities. We only achieved three of those, which was Kodoguza, Rustenburg, and Steve Trete. So the only one that was not achieved was the uh, Mohali city. Uh, and so despite here, just on deviation, despite the project not being achieved, there was significant progress that was made uh, on this initiative. If we could move to the next slide on program two, around the IUDF strategy and implementing the program for the small town regeneration. Uh, so here the IUDF strategy uh, was developed. However, the implementation of the program was what was not finalized as per the plan. Um, and of course, the reasons cited um, are not necessarily reasons that we are too, too happy about, but that was what the department had faced at the time. If we could then just move to the next slide, on still on program two, uh, with regards to integrated planning. Uh, this was to do with coordinating a model for the 44 districts and the eight metropolitan municipalities. Uh, this one we did achieve in that the document, the concept document um, uh, was developed and it contains all the details about the model that needed to have been approved. If we can then move to the next slide. Um, this was to do with the Integrated Township Economic Development Program. Um, this was not achieved in that the draft Integrated uh, Township Economic Development Program was not developed by a stipulated timeline. Um, and at the time, uh, the program um, uh, looked at actually having a service provider in place, but this 
was did not happen uh, according to the timeline that had been set. If we could then move to the next slide. Uh, this was to do with then the DDM concept document uh, needed to have been submitted for approval. Uh, so the DDM concept document uh, was submitted um, and the launch then of the districts was then undertaken. So this was then um, achieved. If we could move to the next slide. Uh, on this one, we had to ensure that we had uh, profiles of the identified districts and metros finalized. And here we had 44 districts and eight metros. Uh, this was uh, achieved 95% uh, of the target um, because we had draft profiles for 42 districts and seven metros. Uh, we have, however, since uh, completed all all the, the profiles, but of course that then fell across into this uh, financial year. If we can move to the next slide. This was to do with the municipal specific uh, revenue plan. Uh, we were to implement in the selected municipalities to assist in increasing their revenue base uh, and re revenue collection rates. Uh, on this one, yes, we, we achieved uh, because we had a, sp a municipal specific Revenue plan implemented in 35 municipalities in line with the specific project plans uh, that would have been assisted to increase revenue and revenue collection. Uh, on, on this uh, performance indicator, there, there were a number of municipalities that needed to be assessed in terms of compliance. Uh, so 71 municipalities were indeed assessed uh, as these were then targeted for compliance um, and uh, in relation to the rating aspects of the NPRA. We can go to the next slide. Uh, there were a number of municipalities that had to be supported uh, to ensure that they had their functional work committees. So this was achieved as the target was 113 municipalities, including the three DDMs. So with the number of district municipalities and metros, uh, where we needed to ensure that we had training on local government on the anti-corruption strategy. So the training uh, was undertaken as per the targets and this was then achieved in the 13 districts. If we could then move to the next slide on the municipal systems amendment bill. And this being introduced to Parliament, um, this indeed was achieved in that the bill was introduced to Parliament by the um, 31st of March. In Programme 4 on disaster management, uh, we needed to look at a number of advocacy and awareness programmes. Uh, these were successfully uh, implemented in partnership with the municipalities to promote and advance the disaster risk reduction. Uh, and then just with regard to the disaster management priority guidelines, these needed to have been approved. Uh, so there were two disaster management priority guidelines approved. So this was achieved. And then also with regards to the number of municipalities assessed on capacity to implement the national fire safety and prevention strategy, uh, the, all the municipalities that were targeted were then indeed capacitated. If we can move to the next slide, uh, there were a number of municipalities. This is program five, who were supported on the mixed spending for the infrastructure development. The target was 183 municipalities, and we supported the 183 municipalities on mixed spending infrastructure. To the, if we move to program six on the community works program, there were a number of work opportunities uh, that we needed to ensure uh, were provided for CWP participants. So uh, the target was 247,466 work opportunities uh, and we achieved 285,277 work opportunities. Uh, so this was more than um, the target that had been set by 15%. And then the number of CW participants trained, we were due to have trained 24,746 CWP participants, but only 23,000 was trained. This makes up 93%, however, not fully achieved. If we can go to the next slide. If we could move to the next slide, please.
Okay, so still continue with program six. We had a number of partnerships that were, we needed to have established. Uh, and uh, we also exceeded this target. We, by one additional partnership, so we established the six instead of the five. Uh, and then the next target was that we had to revise the CWP model. On this one, uh, we had completed the feasibility study for the establishment of the CWP. Uh, and a presentation on this was undertaken. However, the model itself, we didn't finalize. And so uh, it was not um, achieved. If we can move to the next slide, the number of CWP district and metro plans developed. So we developed of the 44 district and eight metro uh, plans. We uh, didn't achieve this. Only 25% of the CWP site plans were consolidated at a district and a metro level. If you could then move to the next slide. So this is the performance summary per program. So uh, we had 21 annual targets. Of those 21, we achieved 13. Uh, and eight then were not achieved. If you go to the next slide, it then tells us how it translates into a percentage. We achieved 62% overall and not achieved was 38%. Uh, and of course, we've also outlined um, what uh, was not achieved and where we are now as compared to the end of the financial year. So the audit of predetermined objectives, if you look at it per each program over a three year period, uh, you will see that um, for this year, the program that was audited was the institutional development, um, which is program three. And we also received an unqualified audit opinion on the AOP oh, on this particular program. So there's an improvement if you compare it to the previous years. If we can then just move to the next slide on the responses to issues and resolutions of the portfolio committee. Uh, the first resolution was that all departments and entities um, reporting to the committee must ensure consistent submission of quarterly performance information. Uh, the department so far has submitted all its quarterly reviews for quarter one and two. With regards to resolution 4.5, um, that DCOG should actually provide a full report to the committee on the CWP model. We have since uh, presented to the portfolio committee uh, and then on resolution 4.6, uh, which is to do with DCOG must furnish a committee with the re uh, report on the assessment of the ward committee's functionality, the report on the assessment of, of the ward committee functiona functionality, uh, including the department's in interventions in this regard, um, has also then been submitted. And then with regards to resolution 4.7, DCOG must brief the committee on all its local government interventions, the presentations on lessons learned from the department's intervention programs uh, needs, need to have been done before the end of the quarter. Uh, and then on resolution 4.8, the DCOG provided a clear report on the role it has played in terms of section 139s. And these have indeed also been presented uh, to, the, to the committee. So if we can move to the financial performance to the next slide, uh, what this is actually indicating is that our appropriation for the year 2019-20 was sitting at 90 billion, just over. And our actual expenditure against that is sitting at 86 billion. And there was a variance of 3.3 billion. Uh, and of course, I'll explain the reason for that variance in later slides. If we can move. If you look at the summary of our audit state of expenditure per program, uh, it, you can see that the program that uh, is sitting with the, the biggest uh, budget is um, on the ID, which is sitting at uh, 3.3 billion in terms of its, um, sorry, variance. Uh, and that was to do with the equitable shares not being transferred and being held back. Uh, but if you go to the next slide, it actually gives a better representation where it says there was a delay in the submissions of the funding requests. 
Uh, and then there was also the withholding of the local government equitable share transfer due to non-compliance and other conditional grants by some of the municipalities. Uh, you, if you also then look at the audit outcome, uh, the, the department received a qualified audit opinion, which is an improvement from the past year's disclaimer audit results or opinion. And the basis for those qualified opinion was to do with goods and services, movable tangible assets and prepayments and advances, which the AG has also gone into detail on. If you can move on to the next slide, um, the basis for our qualification, uh, it's also we've just outlined here what it is, uh, and it was to do with insufficient appropriate audit evidence for payments made to community works program, uh, specifically the implementing agents, uh, due to a lack of accurate and complete substantiating records for payments made for project management fees. And of course, the values are also uh, stated there. And it was also due to insufficient appropriate audit evidence for the completeness of payments made for the CWP participants due to inaccessible implementing agents premises uh, as part of the lockdown. And then invoices that were also received from the CWP implementing agents for 2018-19 uh, were cleared in the current financial were not cleared in the current financial year. So goods and services were overstated uh, by the amounts that are noted. If we can then uh, move to the, the basis for the qualification on the move, movable tangible assets, the AG found that there was insufficient appropriate ordered evidence for movable tangible assets. Uh, and of course, this mainly related to the CWP capital assets um, at the value of 188 uh, million for the year under review. And then finally, just on prepayments and advances, uh, the AG also found that the department did not have adequate systems and controls in place to ensure that all invoices received from implementing agents relating to the current year were actually cleared timelessly. So the, the recommendation that we, that we then have in closing is that the Portfolio Committee should actually note the Auditor DCOG annual performance information and the annual financial statements for the period 2019-20. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you so much to all the uh, members, uh, Portfolio Committee members. Continue, Chair. I don't know whether it's my network. Whew. Andy, let us look like we have lost the chair. Andy, let's... Yes, I'm, I'm trying to find out now where she is. All right. It looks like we've lost the chair. I think, uh, meanwhile, you are trying to find the chair. We can go to the next presentation. Yes, Mr. V. Is, yeah, is the next presentation Misa? Yes, yes. Misa and yes, honorable member. Yes, I think, yeah, the Misa can proceed with the presentation. 
Thank you very much, Honorable Member. Uh, good evening uh, to the Chair in absentia, uh, Honorable Members of the Committee, Minister, DGs and, co and colleagues. Uh, my name is Victor Matada. I'm the Head of Strategy in the CEO's Office in MISA. I'm going to take the committee through the annual report for MISA for the period uh, for the year 2019-20. Uh, the, the focus of the report will be on the performance against the, the key performance, key performance indicator targets in the, in the annual, in the APP for, for the year. The final perf financial performance report. Also, we're going to cover the audit outcomes and, and trend, as well as an update on firstly the filling of vacancies as well as addressing how far we've gone with addressing issues raised by the committee in the previous in the previous year just on the on the vision honorable members uh, our vision is to build us in municipal infrastructure support and to as we strive to 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 try to reach this this ideal we do that by providing integrated municipal uh, infrastructure support services to municipalities through our technical expertise and also skills development programs. Uh, as reflected in our mission on this slide, on the next slide, a reflection on our mandate as, as, the, as the agency, uh, our mandate is to render technical advice and support to municipalities to enable them to optimize the delivery of the of municipal infrastructure. And we we seek to fulfill this mandate by performing these functions as they appear on the slide and as also as uh, promulgated through the the operational notice uh, for for the for the entity that was uh, that was published in 2013 firstly we support municipalities around planning for delivery of infrastructure, infrastructure for services for basic services we also support them to implement projects uh, that uh, intended to, are intended to enable them to, to deliver the basic services as reflected in the IDPs. Also, we focus, our, our support focus on enhancing the ability to operate and maintain, and maintain existing municipal infrastructure. We also finally focus on assisting municipalities to build their own internal capacity so that over a period of time they become self-sufficient in delivering the, the basic service infrastructure and also the, the services. And we perform other 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 functions that are, are linked to the to the above. Uh, going to 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 the next part, uh, honorable members, where now we focus on the core of the presentation that seeks to highlight performance against the targets in the APP would like to to indicate that in the annual performance plan for the year we had 24 key performance indicators indicators targets and uh, we achieved 19 of those targets which uh, which equates to 79 percent that has been reflected by the chairperson earlier and we do admit that this is far from ideal especially considering that in the last meeting where we presented our previous year financial annual report, there was an emphasis to the effect that we need to to always strive to achieve all the, the performance against in our APP. So we are hoping that going forward we'll, we'll still uh, we'll try all our best to reach to reach that that target. So just looking on the at the bottom of of the 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 the, the, the bottom left of the the, 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 the slide we're just reflecting on the trajectory where we moved from 78 in 2015, 16, and then we went down to 59%. And then the, the trend started to, 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 to go up, reaching 63% in 20, 2017, 18. And, and lastly, and last year, we achieved that 1%. As I have indicated, there's this decline that we have experienced in the last financial year, which we need to to rectify going forward. Just going into the details, uh, honorable members, 
just in the interest of time, I will don't say a lot about those indicators that we have achieved. So our organization is divided into th three programs. The first one is this administration that provides the support to the core program, to the two core programs. And under this one, we had uh, we had about we had a total of six uh, indicator targets, and uh, it is important to indicate that we achieved all those six. I wouldn't necessarily uh, reflect on them. I will I will, I will prefer uh, honourable members to focus more on the core on the core programs. So I'll skip the ones under administration and go to technical support services, under which we we this is the the, the biggest program in our in our organisation in terms of the number of employees as well as the budget allocated, because this is the program through which we deploy our our technical experts to go and support municipalities to enable us to achieve what I've expressed as our objectives and our our mission. And under this program, in the 2019-20 financial year, we had we had a total of of 14 uh, indicator targets, performance indicator targets. And we achieved nine, and we couldn't achieve uh, fully achieved five of the indicators. Starting with the one on the uh, around the support to municipalities to develop and implement technical support plans, that usually encompass a lot of other work that we do through our engineers. We targeted to support 87, and then we we succeeded in in supporting them and enabling them to develop those plans and implementing them as well. The next one is relates to our support through our our district teams towards uh, enhancing the capacity of municipalities to to spend their MIC. Historically, this has been a problem and continue to be a problem. And as it can is, is shown on our, on this slide, we couldn't fully achieve this. In fact, our performance was way way below par, with only 14 out of 87 municipalities targeted being able to record. Uh, achievements again the threshold of 70 as at the end of the, the the fourth quarter of the financial year for for us as MISA, which is the third quarter for municipalities. So the threshold that we put is 70 percent, but only 14 managed to achieve that. And the reason why we are we, we continue to struggle in this one is because most of these municipalities that couldn't achieve 73 of them continue to express some instability due to to some governance challenges, mainly related to, to political instability. And some of them will, will, will not have the, the necessary capacity within themselves, and that contributes to slowing down the implementation of the projects, particularly when it comes to supply chain uh, processes, which, which, which get slowed down either due to the governance challenges or due to capacity challenges. And, and those are the things that we, we are focusing on to try and address and improve the performance in relation to this area. The next one relates to the support to municipalities on, on the development and implementation of Spruma compliant, compliant plans. So we support municipalities here around the development and implementation of their, 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 their plans that are, that, that are required to be compliant with the Special Planning and Land Use Management Act and we achieved this indicator. So this indicator was in fact split into two targets. The second target uh, was on the development of the framework that we needed to develop to ensure that municipalities are aligning their, their IDPs with social plans, with social labor plans rather, particularly focusing on those municipalities that are within the mining areas. So we achieved these indicators for the year. The next one uh, is on the support to municipalities uh, to develop and implement sector plans. We targeted 20 municipalities, and again here we achieve as well. The next one, the next indicator was on on supporting the three district municipalities that were selected previously as part of the pilot, uh, as part of the pilot for the on the regional management support program. And this is a turnaround program that we we initiated with the support of, of dedicated allocation from National Treasury. And uh, this prog this pilot phase has come has, has come to an end. But in the in the in the last financial year we continue to support these uh, three district municipalities or Chambos, Kukune and Namatole. 
to continue with the pilot phase and we achieve this indicator. Another indicator that we couldn't achieve is on the assessment of water and sanitation infrastructure functionality. We had targeted 18 districts, but we only succeeded in completing those assessments in, in 10. We couldn't do the same with eight because although we're at an advanced stage of completing the assessments, we had to withdraw at, at the time when the declaration of disaster uh, came into effect as to, destroy, to, to, to withdraw our, our engineers and young graduates who were undertaking the assessments. As a result, we've been completing eight eight uh, district municipalities in uh, all of them in KZ10. The next indicator also, we couldn't achieve the next indicator, which uh, involves the enrollment and training of apprentices to enable, towards the, to enable them to, to qualify as artisans in various technical disciplines. Our targets were 230. We started the year with 134 learners in our program, but we need so, which meant that we needed to enroll additional 100. We couldn't complete that mainly because of the, the very extremely large number of, of learner applicants that we received at various, at various levels. And as a result, we had to engage a number of uh, authorities to verify their, their qualifications and personal credentials. So the process was a bit complicated. As a result, there was a delay and we couldn't finalize that verification. Although it must be uh, highlighted that at the end of the year, we had already finalized the, our own, the, the bulk of the recruitment process, but the verification was the one that was delayed. The next one is on the, the learners uh, that uh, we, we, we wanted to enroll for experiential learnership, which is another learning programs under MISA uh, that seeks to, to, to support uh, young people who are coming out of TVS colleges to enable them to, to acquire some experience in their, in their field so that they can increase, can increase their chances of, of finding employment in municipalities and other areas. Our target was 75, we, 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 our, our target was 70 rather, but we exceeded that target by five in the, in the financial year. The next one, which is also another learning program is the enrollment of young graduates um, for training towards uh, registering as professionals in various technical fields. Our target was 135, we exceeded that by two, as our, our, our chief target was 137 for the year. The next one is relates to the training of municipal officials. We, through this indicator, we target uh, municip uh, municipal officials who want to upskill themselves in various technical fields, particularly focusing on those that are involved in the delivery of of infrastructure in municipalities. Our targets were 250, we, we exceeded this. And the, one of the, the reason why, the main reason why we exceeded is because we managed to obtain additional funding from within our, our savings and we, we directed some of the money towards this. As a result, we, we had to ramp, we, we ended up ramping up the, the, the training and, 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 and achieving a higher number in terms of the officials that were trained. The next one, is focus focuses on the training of municipal officials. This one is ta is targeted at those municipal officials who are or who have, who have already acquired sufficient experience in the provision of um, in the performance of functions relating to the delivery of infrastructure in municipalities, but they don't have the academic qualifications. So we train them with the support of the TVET colleges, with the aim of uh, of getting them to to acquire qualification as artisans. So our target was 80. We only managed to achieve 49. We couldn't, we couldn't enroll the, the remaining 31. And there are two main reasons on this one. The first one was that during the course of the year, we experienced delay due to changes in the tools, assessment tools that are used by the Department of Higher Education. Because this learners needs to, this official needs to be assessed to determine their level of competency before they enroll in the program. So there were changes in the tools for electrical uh, uh, fields, but then that was rectified, but it was really quite late in the year. The second reason is because we also, again, had to withdraw these learners during the assessment period after the declaration of the state of disaster arising from the, the COVID-19. And uh, as a result, we couldn't complete, complete 
uh, the process of getting them to enroll into the program. The next one, which was achieved as well, is on the buzzer program that we have, that we implement targeted at, uh, at students in TVET colleges and universities uh, enrolled in, in, in technical fields. Our target was 80. We, we managed to, to, to provide buzzers to 132 during the year because mainly because we, we received additional funding through our, our, our partnership with LG CETA, and then we had to, to bring in additional, uh, more, more students than we, we, we intended. The next one is the number of municipal supporters with the compliance and implementation of capacity development plans. Through this, this indicator, we, we, we aim to, to support municipalities with the development of capacity building plans so that each municipality can have an integrated plan to build capacity within themselves. And our target was to develop and implement 15, but we only managed to do seven. Eight of those couldn't be achieved because we experienced a, a, a dispute that was raised by the service provider that was assisting us with the development of these plans. And as a result, it slowed down the whole process completely, uh, leading to, to the non-achievement of the indicator. Under the next program, which is the infrastructure delivery management support, we had four key performance indicator targets, and uh, all of them were achieved. The first one uh, was focusing on the establishment of the PMO, and we managed to, to, to achieve this one because this process involved the, the, the development of the methodologies and standards and procedures for the functionality of the PMO. The next one, which was also achieved, was on the support support to municipalities towards the implementation of the the infrastructure delivery management system that uh, has been uh, issued by National Treasury. Uh, we support we targeted support through municipalities, and we, we achieved that target as well. The next indicator, which was also achieved, was on the framework contracts support municipalities to utilize the framework contract that we have. We had set up as MISA uh, with the support of National Treasury. Our target was to have seven contracts, but uh, we managed to exceed that by, by a very high number of 43. We, we ended up with uh, reaching 58 uh, municipalities supported on the, on, on, the, on the implementation of the framework contracts. The next one uh, under the IGMS relates to the feasibility study support on the feasibility studies conducted to address misalignment between articulation, water articulation and bulk infrastructure. We targeted five municipalities and we achieved all of them. The next part uh, focuses on the financial performance. And if you look at the first part, the first slide that, uh, that, that gives a reflection on our income and expenditure, it shows that our, our Total income from transfers was 343 million, uh, and we also generated some income from some interest, and that brought our total to 347 million. But our expenditure at the end of the year stood at 401 million, which then left us with a deficit of 54 million. That was a reduction from the previous year deficit of 72 million. The next slide. On, on the financial positions, it reflects that the fact that uh, uh, as at the end of the year, our current assets were 100 million, our non current assets with, was 26 million, and our liabilities were 66 million, leaving us with the net assets of of 60 of about 60 million for the year. The the next slide just give a reflection on the budget versus on the budget variances. And this is based on the total income that includes the, the retention money. As, an, as, a, as a government component, we're allowed by Treasury to retain funds that we remain and spend at the end of the, of the previous financial year. So when you include the, the retention that was uh, approved by Treasury, our total budget uh, increased to 426 million. And as I have indicated earlier, that our expenditure was 401 million. That left us with a, with a, with a with a, with a supplies of about 24 million in for the year. 
This slide just gives a summary of what is reflected in the previous slides. I will jump to these four slides. It just shows the the variance, budget variance per, per, per individual programs. I wouldn't dwell too much on this, uh, honorable members. I'll move to our cash flow statement, which reflects our opening balance of 146 million at the beginning of the year. And also the, the, the money that we received of 347 against the payments of 394, as well as the, the assets purchase of about about 850,000, which left us with a balance at the, the year, the, at the end of the year on our cash flow statement of about 98 million. The next slide on the wasteful, fruitless and wasteful expenditure, we're showing some, some historical numbers in terms of the wasteful, fruitless and wasteful expenditure in CAD, uh, particularly in the, in, the, in the earlier years of MISA, uh, after MISA's establishment. And we, the total in our books at, at the end of the financial year was about 800, 984 million. This is attributed to salary overpayment, which is the biggest amount, which is what the second biggest amount. And this was a payment that was made to somebody who resigned and the, we couldn't necessarily prevent the payment of the salary after the resignation due to some, 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 some challenges but also the penalties that we had to pay to SARS that when came during the, in care during the transitional period, when we move our books from, from DBSA, which previously supported MISA, to MISA previously in the, in, the, in, 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 the, in the previous financial years. And also lastly, the small amount at the bottom is what we incurred, the interest we incurred because of the money that we owed for TV licenses. And the reason for this one is because at some point SABC were sending invoices to an individual who later resigned and who couldn't receive those invoices. We have since rectified that. Coming to the regular expenditure, as at the end of the, the year, financial year, we didn't have any regular expenditure at all. We, we, the, the regular expenditures we, we incurred in the, in the earlier years had already been cleared through our engagements with National Treasury and we, we are sitting now currently without any regular expenditure. Uh, in terms of payments, so with, within the payments of 30, 34, 30 days, I think we only have one case where we couldn't pay uh, within the, the 30 days uh, prescribed, uh, but it's something that we have since addressed and we going forward, we don't, we don't foresee that problem and caring. So those bars, they indicate, they just indicate the comparison between uh, the extent to which we are paying within the, the 30, 30 days period. So that is just uh, the small minor challenge that we need to address, which is shown in the blue color um, as a result of that uh, one, one payment that was done within outside the, the 30 days requirements. Coming to the audit, audit outcome without repeating what has been said earlier, we have obtained the clean audit for the previous uh, for the past uh, financial years, including the one we are we're focusing on now, the 2019-20, I'll jump this one. Uh, these two or three slides are just a reflection on the fact that we, during the course of the year under review, we managed to address all the issues that were, were raised by, by the Auditor General in the audit of the previous financial year. So I will, I will move on. For the, for the year under review, we, we have, Four, in the, four, four findings that were raised by AG during the audit for 2019-20, and we've already addressed one of those findings. The ones that one are not addressed, they relate to one finding on, on procurement and contract management, and two findings on the, the, the IT systems that we are currently dealing with now. So that the aim is to ensure that by the end of the financial year, we've, we've addressed all those three outstanding findings as raised by the Witcher General. Just uh, honorable members, on the recruitment, on the progress around recruitment, we just want to surprise the committee uh, about how far we've gone with this process. As uh, we've shown, we've, 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 we've indicated before, our current structure that was approved in 2017 has got a total of 221 posts. And uh, 
when we reached the year end, our vacancy rate was 24% uh, as a result of us having filled 167 positions out of that total. At SMS level, the vacancy was sitting at, um, at about uh, 22%. And uh, at among the technical positions, the, we had filled about 83, a total of 83% of 70 out of 84 positions, which shall translate to 83%. On the gender equity, when we closed the year, our, 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 our performance was 41% females versus 59 males at SMS level. But we, we are pleased to announce the, to the committee that since then we have, we, we have improved that ratio to 47% females at SMS level, which which is which which augurs well for us towards achieving the 50-50, the minimum of 50-50 that, uh, well, that is mandatory. Still on the status of recruitment, one area that is worth highlighting is our, our performance against the, the 2% monetary targets when it comes to the recruitment, appointment of people with disability. As at the year end, we're sitting at 0% in, in, in this regard, but we have since moved to 0.5% because we've got one employee who is, uh, uh, who is, who is categorized as, as, as a person with disability in our, in, our, in our entity at the moment. There's just one position that remains unfilled and it has been vacant for some time, which is the, the DDG position for technical support services. Uh, and the, the process of filling this position is at, a, at an advanced stage. Uh, as we speak, the shortlisting is, is is being done, and we're hoping that before year end will will they fill this position. Uh, on the positive, we managed to fill the other DDG position for IDMS or for infrastructure delivery management support sometime at the beginning of the the current calendar year. This again just gives the summary of where we were at the beginning of the year. I won't repeat that. Similarly, if, if with respect to technical experts, I want to put that summary again, just to reflect that with regard to the filling of technical positions, we have since improved from that 83% to, to, to about, um, to about, uh, to about 92% now, uh, during the, after the end of the financial year, there was, there are still some there are key challenges that we, we continue to experience as the organization, and mainly they relate to, to our the retention of particularly of engineering uh, or technical professionals who from time to time some of them uh, resign from the organization, which which compel us to, to undertake the recruitment process again to fill those uh, resulting vacancies. Also, the fact that we we, we, we have not reached our, our equity targets as it relates to the appointment of people with disabilities. I've indicated what, where we are at the moment and we are continuing to engage the, the, the relevant association bodies with a view to soliciting applications from their members as we advertise the position. Also, we are also still complete undertaking the process of realignment of our organization structure structure as directed by DPSA in the time of, of, of issuing the concurrent to the structure in 2017. Also, as is the same with every other agency of government, we, we are left the fact that there are looming budget cuts that are likely to affect mainly, or not mainly, but also the, the composition of employee budget. And as a result of that, we are working on a process of identifying critical positions so that we prioritize filling those so that if there are any that we couldn't fill due to budget, budget constraint, we, those shouldn't be the critical positions. So we are working on, on that process. On the staff retention, the, the remedial measure there is to come up with a retention strategy that we are finalizing. And hopefully we'll have that uh, approved by the end of the, the current quarter. Two issues that were raised uh, lastly by the by, by the portfolio committee when we presented the 2018-19 uh, annual report. The first one is what I've already touched on, which uh, is about the need for us to, to always aim for 100% achievement when it comes to ABP targets. 
uh, I've already said where what, what our our performance was and uh, and also the reasons why we couldn't achieve all those each of those five uh, indicators that that, that that were not achieved in the year. On the retention of technical personnel, which of course is a source of instability for the organization, as we have to from time to time have to fill the positions as they become vacant. I've already indicated that we are developing a future strategy to address that. Uh, in conclusion, we our performance has gone down and we, we, have, we are making an undertaking to strive to, to increase it and to remain to maintain it at a high level going forward. Of course, as the minister has put it correctly, so if you look at our performance from the, the last quarter that we have already reported on, our performance is looking good against the APP targets. But of course, we need to elevate our discussion as towards dealing with the issue of impact and, and outcomes that we, we achieve. We, we need to achieve by by performing the, the functions that we are we are managed, we are managed to perform. And, and needless to say that we we have also again achieved the unqualified audit without material funding. And honourable members and chairperson, thank you very much. I will I will pause here with regard to, to MISA AP, annual report for 2019-20. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ndade. Uh, now that uh, time is no longer on our side, I'm going to allow members to engage the presentation that has been presented to us this evening. Uh, members, can you please uh, raise your hands or show your face if you want to engage on the presentations. We have uh, Honorable Brink uh, will be the first speaker and then followed by Honorable Mkalipi, uh, followed by Honorable Opperman, then also followed by Honorable Runevald. I'm just trying to check if we do have other members who have shown their face or... Uh, I think it's only the four hands that we have. So I'm going to now give to Honorable Brink. Honorable Brink. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Acting Chairperson. I will start with the presentation, the AG, uh, and I, I simply have questions to all of the, uh, or at least to, to all of the accounting offices arising from um, page, 24 of the AG's document, where reference is made to various tender irregularities. The first is uh, DCOG, non-submission of declaration of whether uh, the service provider is employed or connected to any person employed by the state. Uh, yes, it's an audit finding, it's one example, but can we please have the details of that contract? Uh, it, there's no reason it shouldn't be given. I think it's in the public interest that it's given. And if the uh, DG can give us uh, the confirmation that that declaration was in fact obtained from the service provider. The second one is uh, still on page 24, details of the contract where there was non-compliance with SEM in general in DCOG. The third one, the CRL contract awarded on points not calculated in terms of the Preferential Procurement Policy Framework Act. And then lastly, the Municipal Demarcation Board um, where the details of the winning bidder weren't published. Um, then, uh, Acting Chair, if, if the AG representative can just explain to us the National Treasury reprieve given to DCOG uh, or the departure, they call it, um, so that they don't have to uh, uh, report or, or re so that their irregular expenditure in, in respect of the CWP is not reflected until March 2021. 
Uh, maybe you can just explain to us in a little bit more detail how does this provision work, um, it's, and, and you know what what are its implications? Do we just uh, ignore that expenditure for time being? Um, what is concerning to me is that the CWP being the major source of irregular, irregular expenditure and adverse audit findings, we discovered that the department has not in fact come up with a redesigned model. So we're still sitting at this late hour with a flawed model. Um, but uh, yes, we, you know, we, had our, we had our words about that uh, at the last meeting. Uh, on the issue. Then turning to the presentation of uh, COGT or DCOG uh, chairperson, um, it's, it's interesting that there were two targets mentioned as achieved uh, related to the district development model. Uh, and they were, um, I think, under on slide 10 and slide, yeah. And, uh, two, so, so basically two targets that were achieved by one thing, namely the, uh, the district model being approved. And I, I just wanted to know, um, is this, reg is this a, a regular thing that, that one act achieves two targets? In any event, it just seems to me um, a bit tenuous. Um, then, it, it's very difficult to, to take any of the targets mentioned as achieved under the CWP as, as credible, given uh, the, the trouble with regards to that program, and especially because the AG has mentioned that very little of the performance uh, was actually uh, audited. Then some more specifics, uh, Chairperson. Um, on slide... Sorry, on slide uh, nine, as well as slide 11, uh, targets related to the regional and urban development and legislative support program. Um, a draft IUDF strategy was meant to be done for small, uh, small town regeneration. And uh, secondly, uh, um, there was a, a program for um, the Integrated Township Economic Development Plan. And both of these targets could be achieved because service providers weren't appointed. Now, my question is, do we really need service providers to do these things? It's a bit strange. The IUDF is an existing document. Um, I think that the Cities Network had a role in putting it together. They themselves outsourced the work. Why do we need further service providers to implement the strategy? It doesn't really make sense. Uh, and the same point applies to the, econo uh, the Township Economic Development Program. Um, why, would you want, why would you need external people to put that together and implement it? Is it not within the mandate? You know, we talk a lot about consultants being used by municipalities, but here we have the department doing the same thing. Now, the other thing that arises from, from these targets not being met is that the budget of the departments was largely spent. Uh, so the question arises, if these service providers were actually appointed, or if they were, if the department did appoint them, would there have been money to pay them for whatever, for, for whatever work um, they uh, were meant to do in, in coming up with these uh, plans? Then chairperson, uh, Slide 16, um, institutional development. Um, number of municipalities supported to have functional ward committees. Is this, is this a real achievement or is it just a paper exercise? Is it a tick, tick box exercise? What was the nature of the support given to these municipalities? If we just have some elaboration so that we make sure that we're not you know, we're not talking here about things that, that really don't have any substance. 
Then slide uh, 17, institutional development, number of district municipalities, metros, where training was given on the anti-corruption strategy. Maybe we can just have a comment from the minister and the DG as to whether this anti-corruption strategy is uh, successful. Um, what the assessment is of, of that. Then slide 14, again, institutional development, municipal specific revenue plans were implemented apparently in 35 municipalities where, where DCOG gave their support. Uh, for interest sake, can the minister and the DG tell us whether revenue collection has actually improved in these 35 municipalities? Uh, we know that the, they not measured here on the actual success of the programs, just their implementation. But uh, can can you point to the success of this? Because surely that that is quite important. Um, then, a chairperson, turning to uh, Misa, uh, my only question to Misa is: um, Have have they done an assessment of the engineering skills available to municipalities to implement infrastructure projects? Because many of their targets are aimed at enhancing the internal capacity of municipalities to, to undertake these projects. But um, if that's going to be given, surely we need some sort of an assessment of the need. And if that is not part of what MISA does, uh, does the CEO um, or the responsible person here not think that it should be added as one of the objectives? Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Honorable Brink. Uh, can I please give Honorable Huenevald because he has a problem with budget. He does need to ask some key questions and then he'll charge the gadget. Can I please allow him to speak? Then I'll go to Honorable Kalipi and Operman after. What is the problem? His gadget is on 15% and it's going to take him some few minutes before he can charge his gadget. Neighbor. So probably by that time we would have finished our uh, question session. Okay. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you for the committee's patience. Um, so that it's only one question. I've looked through the, uh, the AG's um, can I say presentation, and one thing that came was quite clear is that the department cannot give or cannot provide adequate assurance that speak to the leadership in the department. That's top management and middle management. This resulted into a weak management that lead to weak controls that lead then again to weak outcomes. In contrast to that, you can see in MISA, there's a good assurance, meaning good management, and then we can see that it led to good results. So my question to the minister will be, minister, what steps are you going to take to, to ensure that there's better management in the department of Cocta? And I think that's one of the problems, if you're going to look over all of all the problems in Cocteau, especially those that um, Honorable Brink touched on as well, um, can be resolved with better management. So what steps are the minister going to take to ensure that there's better management in the department? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. And uh, now I'm going to allow Honorable Mkalipi Yabongaslalo, a whip of the committee, who is the interim chair. Thanks very much. Uh, I just want to find out from the minister and the department is why the department unable to implement 85% of the 2018 and 2019 post audit action plan. And uh, if the department is failing to implement their post audit action plan, how does the department will be able to assist municipalities to implement theirs. Uh, because I remember, uh, uh, Chairperson, when we received this uh, uh, action plan that was presented to us, 
uh, in March, I think it was March in, 20, in 2019, we were so excited because of the various reasons, especially the frustration that as the committee we've also raised as a concern in terms of the department not be able to do their functions. As I, uh, I ask specifically if the department is failing, how is the department going to be able to monitor and help the municipalities? Because we were in a crisis in terms of the service delivery and we, we need the department to come uh, to our rescue to make sure and to ensure that the municipalities are be able to do their functions. But now I'm very concerned and I really want to hear from the minister because we have raised this thing several times with the minister. And I remember very well when we have um, been told that there is a new a DG in the department. We are so excited as the committee and we said to the minister, we are moving to a right direction in terms of getting things right in this department. So now we are receiving this kind of a report and you are not even given a full uh, detailed report as why the department have failed to implement this action plan that we thought is going to uh, make sure that the department is is, is is moving forward in terms of their uh, action plan. That is one. I, Chairperson, I was hoping that uh, Honorable Mamkiza would be here because I, I really do, does not understand the, the MESA in a nutshell. You know, when the presenter was also uh, very honest to say that out of 87 targets, they have achieved only 14. This is the concern that we always raised here. We know that there's an issue of a capacity in, in MESA and we are talking about aging infrastructure in the whole country. And we thought that MESA would be one of the most progressive intervention in the country. But I remember in her forward to annual report of MESA, the minister reports that in 2019 that the cabinet Lehota supported the proposal to strengthen the capacity of MESA to enable effective fulfillment of the expanded role of the agents. So we, re we really want to get a, a, a from, the, from the political head of the department in terms of MESA, because I, whenever we go, uh, we, you, you know very well, is either at a provincial level when people of MESA has to report, they tell us about one thing and one thing only is the capacity. They don't have enough people uh, to implement those projects while we are experiencing the aging infrastructure and it's getting worse. It's not even getting better. So therefore, we really ha we have to hear from the minister in terms of MESA and the role of MESA if it's still going to help us uh, or the minister have other ways and means to ensure that MESA uh, provide what's supposed to provide a uh, 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 will always tell us that uh, Mesa will, will also uh, promise things, but when when she go back to to a Lali Nema farm, people will complain about the same problem. So if the minister can allude to that fact and the DG of the department would be very happy. Thank you very much, Whip. Thank you, Honorable Mukalipi, Honorable Oberman. Thank you, Chairperson. I'd like to know who was responsible for the 7.5 million in fruitless and wasteful expenditure within the CWP program. And I'd also like to know last in the last financial year, it was reported that millions have been paid to deceased participants within the program. I want to know, has the register since been cleared? And what happened to the millions that was paid do government officials on the register, have they paid back that money or not? And how do a person on the ground access GovCheck? And how do you monitor that the issues reported by the communities have been resolved? Then I'd also like to know which service provider was appointed for the Integrated Township Economic Development Program. And regarding the increased revenue collection program, that specific revenue plan, has that proved curable and did that rectify the situation in the municipalities? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Opperman. 
Honorable, Honorable Mamchize. <coughs> yeah, yes, Chair. Chairperson. Chair. Hello. Hello. Uh, okay. I thought I thought um, you wanted to say something about Mr. But it's okay if you haven't raised your hand. No, 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 no. I can I can say something with Mr. But remember, uh, Chair, where I am, the lapok shone kona la wamalu. Koto again gizo kulumanje goba. The afun gutin kulumen on Mesa today. Uh, today, all I can say about Mesa. Young Baben complainer, Honorable M. Kalipa is right. I always say that about Mesa, but one day I go to KZN as I'm in, as I'm in KZN as we speak. They took me to the plant, uh, show me that there is a plant, but that is not functioning. I said to them, they must make the plan to function so that we clap the hands. We cannot clap the hands for imishini. Your imishini is boni le bang tata langaya ko onangoma bunglo ngilwa. Ngai fikri imishini mlingi mara amazina majawe ko laika. So angazi ke uti bang tembisa for two weeks. So look, it two weeks it dule zek dule ne three weeks ne four weeks manch. Aba amazawe ko laika. Se safara ma paipi sa kipi mali zetu sa tonza manzi aweko. Se njikutike chepesi. We still have a problem about water shame. And uh, even utugela 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 uh, municipality. Abantu na msanje bengzula ngakona sibugo tenguza kwe sifo. Nkibeze omunyu mama. Ukala nguti ama paipa tuelizwe longe kota manza wa fanshin. Mina ngazi kuti. Agwenzo enjan. Ae fagelu ala ama paipa tuelizwe longe. Kwa maspala. Why nga get pandwe lento le yalu maspala bu maspala. Ama faga ama paipa tuelizwe longe. Ato ali panza kichi mi panza kota manza nga bibi kawa nbe nga bina manza. Kandi china senza nsu kwa kutaka segasu. Gula boma spala. Si pisi tope si sifaga au jengo kokte. Tazi ilendo kunumele zintozo zoma spala. Mtu za ze zule. Aku hakunume nela kongo na kona kufiwe. Serious. Pelangi akunuma la bandu na papa selila. Ah, hii rongo lento. Ngoba oma spala. Si akona. Gya akona. Ongu mtu akona. From at the top. Si akona sonke. Si akona lani. Ama paipa toli zwe longe bazalwani. If we need to know man, I saw Benson's oversight in Kombe. I want a man, the Banda Banda Manzi. Now, Lang Corner, Lanjo Bakshon, when Jamans are doing a month or Zed. I no, Minan Sayas, the Dufnassin. Okay, thanks, Chaperson. Thank you, Honorable Mam Chise. Now I'm going to allow uh, Decock and Misa and Auditor General to respond to the issues raised by honorable members. There's a hand from the chairperson chair. Oh, I did not check the, the, the list. Uh, before we can allow the, 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 the responses, I will give uh, the chair. Uh, chair. Thank you. I hope I'm going to be audible. I had an issue around the Disaster management. Uh, the 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 question is about the lessons that the department has learned from the COVID nineteen pandemic in terms of the capacity of its disaster management function, and then uh, what is the plan to address the identified challenges, and then. Uh, in a report somewhere in between, there is a report that says 49 CWP participants uh, Colleagues, we've lost the chair. Uh, yes. 
allow the department to to respond. Thanks, uh, DJ, and uh, good evening to the chair and the honourable members and the minister. Chair, the, there are three questions from my side. Uh, the first one from Honourable uh, Brink. Uh, I think it's slide uh, 10. Uh, the, the, the mo it's about the model, integrated planning and coordinating model uh, that, that was approved by the minister, uh, which was the target. But uh, the concept document, uh, which, which uh, details the, 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 the model itself. It was approved by, by cabinet. Uh, it, it, it's one target, uh, which is about the model uh, and the model which was expressed in the, in the concept uh, document uh, was, was approved. On, on, the, on the IUDF, uh, uh, the two programs, uh, Firstly, on, on the IUDF, <clears throat> the, the IUDF, uh, the, the honorable member is correct. Uh, it is a, a policy document that is, is it's existing already. But what, what that policy document advocates for, it's a, it's a focus on three areas uh, to deal with the implementation. The, the first one is the focus on metropolitan municipalities, uh, the eight metros. Uh, and secondly, is the focus on intermediate cities, which, which are largely your, your secondary cities. And then the last area was to then look at small towns uh, because it then covers the, the, the whole uh, sort of spectrum of, of municipal spaces. So on the metro side, there is a program, dedicated support program, city support program, uh, which is led by Treasury. The second one on the intermediate cities, there is also a dedicated program that is focusing on, on supporting the, the intermediate cities. So this one, it's a, it's a new program which we, we, we were planning to, to, to actually develop so that we are able to focus uh, on uh, a program that is going to be targeting support uh, small officials have received the integrity commission's report on investigations into health mec dr bandile masuku his wife uh, uh, my apologies uh, ndate Honorable members and colleagues, can you please mute your microphone? You are disturbing the meeting. You can proceed, Ndati. DG? Unmute yourself, DG? Oh, sorry, 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 Chair. Uh, sorry okay, about that. It automatically yeah, my... actually, yes. No, I'm saying on, on the township, integrated township uh, economic development program, Thank you. this this was a, a new uh, a, a program to understand how do we support uh, township economies. It's a new study to also look at the uh, what are the economic uh, opportunities that are obtaining in township and how do we support stimulation of, of economic activities in the township? And then the program is meant to also provide us with a dedicated focus of how do we deal with township uh, economies, understanding the dynamics and opportunities that are provided for uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the townships. The, 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 the budget for, for this, it was not really a significant uh, budget. Uh, with, with the delay, uh, the, the budget was then uh, shifted to, to, to cover other areas. The, 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 the other question which was asked, it's the name of uh, a company uh, that, that was appointed for, for the uh, township uh, uh, small town regeneration program. The name of the program, uh, the company service provider, it's a site plan uh, that has been appointed now, which has started with, with, with that plan. And, 
and and also it's a, it's a, a, a project that cost about a, a million for, for that one. And then those are the questions, uh, Chair, that uh, relate to, to my area. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, um, Temba. I will then ask uh, if, sorry, I would then ask if Patando could then just respond to the uh, question around CWP. Dr. Siswana. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, no, thank you, um, Chair, Honorable Chair, uh, Minister and teaching colleagues. The question uh, was about uh, the uh, uh, who was responsible for the deceased and the person in the, in the department. Um, the, the NPOs um, that um, were some were responsible for for the what is the disease and the and the PSR uh, in the system. So what we what we did the uh, chair and honourable members is that we engage with the NPOs and they manage to to clear or maybe to to explain what we mean by clearing that they provide us with evidence that uh, was. Um, very um, uh, helpful in terms of uh, making sure that uh, the evidence uh, before us as, as a department uh, is able to clarify uh, all these matters relating to the personal uh, participants. In some cases where we do not get uh, evidence, we recouped uh, the money from the NPOs. Uh, indeed, it was uh, 7.6. Uh, we we in, in our presentation um, this week, uh, sorry last week, uh, we we indicated that we we recouped uh, the money from the NPOs and um, on the, uh, also the, some NPOs were able to give us provide us evidence with with, 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 with that regard. Maybe on the side of the uh, also on the side of the PESAR, the PESAR, um the some of the um, NPOs were able to clarify one of the key things that is critical chain on the members to note is that um, some of the participants when they join the program they they um, they get employed or they get uh, um, uh, uh, an opportunity to work in a department probably for six months and they get uh, the, the personal number and they move once the contract expires, they move from that department to another entity to work. So in some, in some instances, you find those discrepancies when it comes to PERSAR. So, but what becomes critical for CWP and um, for department is to make sure that uh, they are in line with the policy, which is a threshold of 3.5. Uh, uh, um, so we make sure that uh, they, they, they are within the threshold, but uh, the, that's, these are one of the discrepancies that normally happen, but indeed we recoup the money from the NPOs that were responsible for 7.6. That, that's the key, that's the question that uh, was asked uh, uh, Chair and, and the committee members with regard to the uh, CWP. Thank you, Dr. Siswana. If I could just ask Mr. Nkashe to respond to some of the questions on institutional development. Thank you. Thank you, uh, DG. Thank you, the Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members, Minister. Uh, the first question was that uh, is the anti local government anti corruption strategy impacted on local municipalities in relation to fraud and corruption? And then uh, the, the response there would be that. Uh, uh, we cannot confirm that now because uh, we are in the process of coming up with the tool to assess the impact of the strategy, but we're disturbed by the pandemic of COVID-19 because uh, that started early this year to do the assessment as we finished training or, or rolling the strategy last year on the municipalities. So we couldn't have a, a good assessment as we are busy with the tool currently. 
And then the other question is in relation to the uh, board committees, whether they were trained on the dashboard or it was a, a physical training. Uh, the training was conducted by LG CITAS, whereby the members were given a NQF level two uh, 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 assessment by the by by, by the LG CITA accredited uh, service providers who were training the the the, the, the what uh, committees. And then the other question, which was asked, is in relation to the golf chat. If uh, golf chat maybe. Uh, how if, if 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 the communities are reporting on it, sending SMSs, how does the department know that the municipalities managed to get the response? Uh, on that one, the, the some of the municipalities with with the municipal system uh, management uh, municipalities management systems, whereby the golf chat was linked to the very same municipalities. If you send an SMS through to golf chat, automatically it goes to the municipalities and municipalities as they respond to the particular message, then the department would know that the municipalities, it's true that they have acted on the particular uh, complaint or report sent to them through the system. So those are the questions that uh, were, also, were, were asked and also, the, 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 the what committees, some of the what committees were trained about how to uh, report or assist on handling the, the, the complaints coming from the communities in, in the areas where the golf chat system is not being yet rolled out or where the municipalities doesn't have systems in place for, for them to monitor uh, particular activities or, or reports coming from the communities. Thank you, DG. Thank you, uh, Honourable Chairperson. If I could then just respond to the question around the revenue plans um, for the 35 municipalities and whether the revenue collection has indeed improved in these municipalities. Uh, Chairperson, yes, we do have the report uh, that confirms, uh, but of course it varies. Um, depending on the actual municipality, and this is done through our MSIG report. So, for example, um, Alfred Duma local municipalities, uh, where the department assisted here, was we they did not have consumers that were segmented into their top 10, 50, and 100 spenders for collection and arrangement uh, for big spenders. So. What the department did, we assisted them with segmenting this, and on average, they are now collecting 20.4 million monthly uh, from their top spenders. So for each municipality, the report is, is quite clear in terms of what the outcome of the intervention has really been for that municipality. Uh, and then just with regards to the department not being able to implement 85% of its post audit action um, plan, uh, this would have related to uh, the department having institutionalized its internal control committee that would actually then drive the implementation of the audit action plan. And of course, the key responsibility of the time uh, to, have, to have the key person, sorry, to have meted out the responsibility would have been the CFO together with the, some of the DDGs within each of the, the, the departments. Um, so, Chairperson, uh, I would say, if I could then respond to Honourable Grunewald, uh, it was really about the department staff members having the will to actually drive and implement the requirements. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, DG. Now uh, I'm going to allow Misa. Misa. Chairperson, thank you very much. From Misa's side, we have noted four questions. I will request my colleagues to assist with the three. Um, we, in our midst, we've got the two DGs and the Chief Director for IDMSC in, in Misa. But on the, just to start with the one on the capacitation of Misa as endorsed by Cabinet Lakota previously. 
we we are, after that announcement we embarked on a process uh, which was led by the minister that involved engagement with treasury as a result of that uh, there was an agreement that misa management should come up with a business case we did draft a detailed business case that outlined what were the areas of intervention that we were intending to to focus on but eventually when we submitted our submission or motivating for that additional finding it didn't receive the necessary approval from national treasury um so as a result we got we that, that's where we ended up since we have not really got an opportunity to to boost our capacity to ensure that we we achieve some of the, we address those challenges that honorable, honorable members have rightly so raised. As I said, I request the other colleagues to deal with the three questions that were raised by honorable members. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Matada. Uh, through you, Chairperson, and, and evening to the minister, the, the DG and colleagues. Uh, Chairperson, it's um, Gobeni here. Uh, I will respond to the question asked by Honorable Brink on whether or not MISA ever conducted an assessment on the type of technical or engineering skills required in municipalities. The, the answer is no, we haven't done that. Uh, but we are aware that if we conducted such an assessment, the assessment will focus mainly on two critical areas. Mm -hmm. The first area will be the type of skills that are required. And then the second one will be the numbers that are required. We, we are not necessarily shooting in the dark with regard to the type of skills that are required. We are guided mainly by the type of services that municipalities are offering. Uh, our focus at the moment is on basic services. So the type of skills that we recruit and dispatch to municipalities would then be uh, civil, electrical, uh, town and regional pl planning, uh, uh, construction and project management, we also provide support with uh, solid waste management. Of late, we based, of course, also on the request for municipalities, we are introducing a property evaluation, just piloting that in some of the municipalities. So our programs uh, provide support in, I mean, along those lines with regard to the types of skills that are required uh, or engineering skills that are required in municipalities. With regard to the numbers that are required, and as much as we haven't conducted any study, we, we rely on credible studies which have been conducted by other institutions, for example, SAIS, SAIS PDT. Uh, they have done that over the years. And the shortage of engineering skills in municipalities is it's, 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 it's known, it's known all over. And this doesn't suggest that there is a shortage of engineers in the country, but there is a shortage of engineering skills within local government. And it's something that uh, we, we are concerned about and, and we are in the process of trying to address that. Do we have any intention of conducting uh, such a study? Yes, we do. We have been in discussions with uh, the LG CETA because they have got a similar interest. Uh, that uh, there is a need for us to conduct such an assessment so that we know and we are able then to set medium to long term targets in terms of uh, how we want to improve the situation in, in local government when it comes to engineering. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dante. And now I'm going to give to the minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair, uh, for now, and uh, thanks to all the portfolio committee members. Um, first, let me say I'm, I'm being asked about the leadership of the, in the department. Now, when you arrive in a department, I arrived last year in June uh, in that department. 
you find people there. And you, you can't just say, uh, because uh, the work is not happening, you go, there are processes. Now, let me say, I can tell you if we didn't get a new DG, we, we would have got another disclaim. And I think we should give her a chance. She's only arrived in May of this year. After two years of disclaimers, she arrived. She worked very hard, one, to just get the, or to get the report to the Auditor General and to um, ensure that the department responds to all the queries. So she, she, she and the team have worked hard. But she's only arrived. She, has, she hasn't even finished the year. Secondly, we had a CFO who, when she was uh, going to be disciplined, to the disciplinary process, she kept dodging, kept dodging, she's, and the disciplinary process wasn't taking place. Eventually, on the day when the disciplinary committee was supposed to meet after she had run out of all excuses, she handed over her resignation. And there's nothing we could have done about it. But that happened. We have now got a new CFO. We've got, now we've got a new um, DTG corporate services. So let's give them a chance. The CFO has just started in November, the corporate service is starting now. So that's what I've been doing about the leadership in the department. Of course, there, there, there may be other areas where I can't do much about for now, but at least we are trying. The leadership is important, very, very much so. I agree with, with you. But on the other hand, they say sometimes when you come and you um, look at what is going on and you try and fix things. They say, oh, ministers, when they arrive, they just get rid of people and so on. So we are trying. We are hoping that the new DG working with co new corporate service person, working with CFO, will make a difference. Working with the rest of the team and Already the team is quite motivated for the fact that they didn't, we didn't get a disclaimer this year, which was easily possible to get a, a, a 30 year running disclaimer. So that's, that's what I want to say about the questions around leadership and what we are going to do about the leadership in the department. And we are going to also um, look at the DDG institutional support and the institutional development, and of course the CWP. Now, let me talk about the question that uh, Members asked Mamki, Honorable Mamki, to raise. Now, all of us sitting here know that Cocta does not put pipes on the ground. It's municipalities who do that. And we all know sitting here 
that COPTA has no control over municipalities putting pipes on the ground. We know that a water source is not really provided by COPTA. We, we try and just assist through MISA, putting boreholes and stuff like that, but the, the core business of supplying the source of water is not cooked. We all know it, but I understand that when it's frustrating us, we, 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 we say it's cooked, but we all know it's not. We know that municipalities are in charge of reticulating, but the problem is they reticulate nothing because they put pipes for reticulation when there's no source. But we also know sometimes we are told that the dams are going to be built. I mean, I can say the same thing that Honorable Mamkis is saying about my own home in the rural area. There is a dam there that has been, that was supposed to have been built many years. It keeps changing names, but it doesn't get built. So I think let's, let's direct our frustration where it belongs. It's not caught. I can't answer for the municipalities and them putting pipes on the ground. Sometimes they don't put pipes. Sometimes there is a dam and the municipalities don't put pipes to reticulate. Sometimes there is no dam but they put pipes and there's no water to come through. We are equally frustrated, but it's not, you, you see, we don't have the, the, the mandate or the authority to take over those functions from municipalities. So, but I understand the frustration, but I, I also think Let's, let's call the municipalities and, and I'm glad that the committee is already talking to municipalities directly through its oversight, because that's where those questions should be asked. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Minister. Uh, do we have follow-ups? Maybe while I'm still here, I couldn't ask my questions because of the, the network. If I can quickly do that, that will assist while I'm waiting for the colleagues to do follow-ups on the questions that they raised. I have an issue with regard to the IUDF strategy. Maybe for us to understand, because it's reported in the annual report, what is the name of the service provider appointed to implement the strategy for the small town generation? And what is the role of the South African Cities Network in this regard? We interacted with them, uh, given them being the custodian over the IUDF. The other issue that I wanted to raise was with regard to the forward to the annual report, wherein the deputy minister alludes to the department's responses uh, to the poor municipal audit outcomes emanating from the financial year under review. There is a reference to the initiation of a process to rethink municipal finances. Maybe can the department elaborate on this? The other issue that one wanted to raise is with regard to whether the department Reflect, has reflected on the previous discussion with the committee regarding the 
alternative interventions to support municipalities that are failing to spend their equitable share. Because the current practice that is there is just simply withholding or offsetting equitable share. Uh, it penalizes the citizens of these municipalities that are supposed to, to receive the services. And the other issue minister that one want clarity on, when the department uh, plans to incorporate the district development agenda under program two, and yet program two has not had a dedicated deputy director general in the last few financial years. The question that will come then, how does the department expect to drive the DTM agenda if there is no dedicated personnel to do so. And then I raised the issue, the issue when I got cut, I was talking about the CWP participant who graduated from the University of Northwest. One wanted to understand what was the nature of the qualifications obtained. And the other issue that I wanted to understand what are the circumstances around the contingency, contingent liability as reported in the annual report in the financial statement where in Siriti Institute NPC summons the department for the payment of the retention fee amounting to 2.3 million plus interest of 10.25% uh, interest then in the system, I see Honorable Mkali, please, and it's up. Uh, then I'm not using the video. Is that the only follow-up that one can deal with? Yes, Chair. Chairperson, I just want to yes. correct one thing here. I was listening to the minister uh, because I think he she was responding to me when I also raised some concern regards to the failure of the department to implement the audit action plan. But he, she was not specific uh, on my concern as well on the issue of MESA, because during 2019, the HOTLA, the minister said uh, in the HOTLA, there is a supportive system that has been approved by the HOTLA. But still, we are still receiving um, disturbing news in terms of the role of MESA. But I want to correct something when I was listening to minister responding, saying that we must give credit to the new DG, it's not true. The DG, I think she, she arrived in April. It was already processed, the issue of uh, this disclaimer that the minister is giving. So the credit must go to the acting DG. I think it must. we must not shy away from also telling people who have done the good job for the department. As much as I understand that they work as a collective, but we must not wrongly praise people. I think the former acting DG, which is Temba Fosi, who was the acting by the time when we were frustrated by the, the DG that was uh, that is no longer the DG. I think this credit must go to that person, not the current DG. The current DG will see on the next financial year if she's going to get the, 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 the disclaimer. So I want to correct that one, Chairperson. We must not allow uh, the misinterpretation uh, of events here. Thank you, Chair. Oh, also, Chair, the other thing that I want also to correct here. Um, uh, the issue of, um, of our concern as a committee, I think is, is well captured here uh, in terms of uh, CWP, uh, that program, that is, we always complain about it. So there was a reduced scope of auditing on CWP due to the pandemic and the exemption of the CP, CWP from SCM. So again, the DG, the current DG can't take the credit for that because we know the reason why. It was because of COVID-19. So we must correct it because this thing is recorded. Thank you, Chairperson. And then as and when you respond, the question on disaster management was not uh, responded to. And maybe the AG and the department must talk on the exemption of CWP from uh, supply chain management, the decision that was taken. 
And then Honorable Fraser, because he's failing to connect, is also asking how will the DDM ensure that all corruption, mismanagement, political interference and instability, uh, irregular expenditure, CWP, NPO that have been seen to be at the send of maladministration and exploitation of participants as challenges that existed before COVID-19 are eroded. So those are the questions as members are raising them. Honorable Chair. Adele, you too. Um, uh, I'm not seeing you on the participant end up, but I can hear you proceed as well. Yes, no, no. Thank you, Chair. Let me welcome all the presentations and res responses um, uh, uh, provided. And I, I, I want to... Um, yeah. Co concur with the minister in relation of uh, issues raised in terms of um, us directing some of the questions to municipalities in relation to water supply. I think uh, we cannot argue with that one. We fully concur. Uh, but what, what we are requesting, Chair, um, seeing that we have conditional grants uh, provided to municipalities, Perhaps uh, in, in trying to assist in our frustration, we, we can put stringent measures to ensure that uh, these grants that are given to municipalities, they achieve uh, uh, its uh, uh, intended purposes. For example, uh, Honorable Chair, we have integrated urban development grants uh, and the conditions are very clear on how to spend those grants. Uh, on the basic re residential infrastructure to uh, uh, provide water to poor community, communities, sanitation, uh, roads and waste management. Now, I think uh, the issue that was raised by the Honorable Priti Kavanjava, it's uh, to say at least uh, let us on our side, understanding that uh, uh, municipalities have legislative authority to govern a municipality on their own and the administrative and legislative authority precisely uh, squarely lies in the municipalities and municipal council. But from our side as COGTA nationally, we, we can assist seeing that we are the ones allocating these grants to them uh, to raise concerns in terms of poor service delivery, particularly in the rural areas in relation to water to ensure that when we allocate at the, uh, these conditional grants, at least we follow up and ensure that uh, there is a visible uh, improvement and change to the living conditions of the poor. And we will continue from our side to effect uh, oversights and hold municipality accountable for not um, uh, uh, providing services to the desired level. So. We, we're calling on and requesting that we need to put pressure from all aspects and corners uh, of the spheres of government, especially when there's money involved and there's condition attached to the money that we disperse to municipality. So that's the appeal that we are making, Chair. Thank you so much. Over to the DG team and Misa. Can I check and Miss my my network is giving me problems. It might kick me out. I just want to okay. touch on a few issues so that you can kick me out. Uh, I want to Okay, Minister. What Honorable Mkalipe said, I'm not going to withdraw what I said. Because Honorable Mkalipe said in this meeting, the minister said there is a new DG and we we're all happy, but look at the report you are getting. I was responding directly to what she said about the new DG. I wasn't comparing 
somebody else and somebody else. I was talking about the new DG that she talked about. And I still stand by what I said in relation to that question that she asked. Yes, Temba Fossey was acting up to the time the DG came, but the, 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 the auditing and all the information and everything, DG had to work with the team to get all the information that the auditors needed. I'm not going to withdraw that because you, are, you said we were happy when the minister said there's a new DG. So you are the one who brought the DG into the conversation. So I stand by what I said. And I also want to, I, 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 I have no problem with uh, Temba Fosse. He acted well when he acted, but he wasn't brought into the conversation. You brought the DG into the conversation. And the other issue I want to raise is this issue of grants and water. As we speak, we're discussing with the DG and the Minister of Treasury, Minister of Finance and DG Treasury to say, is it possible for, for us to use NIC, because that's the grant that we transfer to municipalities, for some time to use it for water, because it's actually not for water. Because the pressing need in communities at the moment is water. So if they allow us for the, for the coming financial year to use MIG for the provision of water, then we can have uh, that small leverage over the municipalities because the, the MIG grant would then be directed towards water and MISA can also work with them to assist them in terms of some of the engineering and so on. So I agree with Honorable uh, Khadebe, but at the moment, meat is not for water. So we, we, we are requesting that, but they do get grants from other departments, including from water department, so from the Department of Water and Sanitation. Um, in terms of the capacity for MISA that uh, I think it's Honorable Kalipi who said, yes, there was last year before the COVID and the, and the, and, and the economic situation, we were, there was agreement that the capacity of MISA must be improved. But we all know that the economy hasn't gone well. The budget itself, I mean, instead of getting more money, we would, our budget were cut. So, so it's not that there is no win, it's just that there's no money. That's why me, me so I was talking about also mobilizing uh, resources outside government, because we know the, the, the press of government is, is limited right now. Um, maybe those are the ones, um, or the, the, the issue of the disaster management center and its capacity. The, the, there was a, before I came, I think in May or sometime last year, uh, there was a project, a, a project to look at one, the capacity uh, of a disaster management center plus the location 
where it should best be located. That work is work in progress. Once it's completed, it will be reported to cabinet. And once cabinet has agreed with whatever recommendations will be made, or amended and agree, came up with an agreement, then it will be announced and implemented. Uh, so that work is, is, is ongoing. Um, I think those are the ones I wanted to deal with at the moment. Uh, if I'm not kicked out, if there are remaining things, I'll come back. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Minister. DG and team. Thank you. Over to you. Uh, I would like to ask Mbulelo Sigaba just to respond to the rethink of municipal finances as per the forward of the DM. Thank you. Uh, good, good evening, Honorable Chair of the Committee and Honorable Members, Minister and the leadership from COCTA and MISA. My name is Mbule Loskava. Uh, the, what was driving the rethinking municipal finance, uh, honorable chair, in order to drive infrastructure growth, service provision and economic recovery post COVID-19, uh, the DM thought that we require some financial in innovations in, in the light of a fairly <laughs> enabling and Sorry. Proceed. You are covered. You are protected. Proceed. Oh, yes. Thank, thank you, Chair. And also to to to, to look. To, there were in imbalances that are inherent in the local government fiscal framework, and the manner in which uh, national raised revenue are disproportionately allocated to local government, and also to to understand the constrained revenue basis of individual municipalities together with the escalating governance failing that had become ingrained in the system. So the DM thought that we need to think uh, outside the box because now municipalities, because of COVID, they, their revenue were, were, were shrinking. So there were sort of, uh, there was sort of recommendations that then that we, we needed to, to look at fundings. Uh, uh, looking at the enhancing the municipal borrowing uh, sort of uh, activity so that municipalities can be able to 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 to, to borrow uh, to to finance some of their capital infrastructure and also they, they were proposing the further refinement of the local government equitable share formula those are some of the sort of uh, recommendations that uh, we, we we were putting on the table around the rethinking of municipal finances if I can be short, uh, otherwise there, there is, there, we do have the detail. Thank you. Okay, other responses to the other questions? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Chair. The, 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 the last question that you you asked on behalf of uh, Honorable Schleser, uh, how will the DDM uh, address irregular expenditures, corruption, and, and, and all the other ills of local government. The, the, the approach is, is that uh, we, we recognize that the, the success of, of the, the DDM is also dependent on effective and functional institutions of local government. And, and the, the decision that was taken by uh, the last MINMEC now uh, in October was for us to develop a targeted program for local government. We were actually in a two-day uh, workshop now to look at the program that is going to look at uh, how do we improve overall performance uh, and professionalize local government, addressing issues of financial management, institutional arrangements and administration, governance issues, uh, service delivery issues. And, and that program is going to be a program that is targeted 
uh, at, at overall sort of improvement of, of um, the performance of local government. So the DDM overall will, as a cooperative uh, uh, governance model, will bring all the three years to support uh, local government as part of our sub, uh, section 154 support program. Uh, the, the 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 other question, Chair, it's it's uh, maybe to correct this one. The uh, DDM program two, uh, program two. I'm actually responsible for program two, Chair. So the the post has always been filled on on program two, and and the approach that we we have adopted as a department, Chair, as a quarter family overall. We, we have established uh, provincial teams uh, that uh, includes, comprises of uh, DCOG, MISA, and DTA. And these provincial teams are the ones that uh, are, are supporting sort of the rollout of, of, of the DDM, because it's not just a, a program uh, for, for a, a branch. Uh, DDM is a departmental approach, and Minister has been emphasizing this point that uh, DDM, it must be embraced by everyone. It must reflect everything that we do as as, as court, and that's the approach that that we are we are, we are taking. On the on the, 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 so the who's other... the champion? So who's the champion of the program? If I may ask it the other way. I've been coordinating the program, Chair, working with the, the teams that I'm, to, I'm referring to. OK. The, 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 of the, in the department. OK, proceed. The, proceed. The, 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 on, on the IUDF uh, strategy uh, and, and the role of the Cities Network, Chair, as, as the Cities Network reported uh, to the committee in the last meeting, uh, they, they, <clears throat> they've been part of, of the whole sort of conceptualization and assisted uh, overall in the development of the strategy. And we <clears throat> continue to, to work with the City Net, Cities Network to support the implementation of the IUDF. But as, as you know, Chair, they also don't have uh, the capacity to do some of the, the research work. So we, we have to, to look at how we partner and look at other uh, service providers that can assist at different points. So for example, the, 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 the city support program, as I've said, there's a whole capacity uh, at Treasury that is working on the city program, but we are working closely with them uh, internally, we are working on the program on the intermediate cities. Uh, the area that has been left out, which is uh, uh, an important area because the IUDF is not just an urban program. It also looks at the issue around the uh, urban rural continuum because of the interconnectedness of rural areas to, to urban areas. And we needed to focus on, on uh, developing a, a clear support program that, that uh, is targeting these, these small towns. And that, that was the, the objective of, of that program. But uh, as I've said, the Cities Network, we continue to work with them uh, in, in, in the implementation of, of the IUDF. Uh, thank you, Chair. OK. Do you see the remaining questions? Good, good evening, Chair. Yes. 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 That's two, that's a, a two questions that we ask uh, that we ask chair. And one with regard to the um, University of the West of the Northwest participant. What's the nature of the qualification, chair? Uh, mm. Can can we then provide that? Can we provide that detail to your office chair by tomorrow uh, of the nature of qualification with regard to that participant? That, that's one. And then the other matter with regard to liability, uh, with, uh, uh, with specific reference to serity. Chair, let me indicate that uh, the, um, there are a number of uh, NPOs uh, who also 
uh, we're dealing with, we're also in this situation, we're, dealing, we're currently dealing with that matter. Uh, because for only one reason, um, most of them, they still owe the department. So therefore, we, we cannot release the retention fee where they still owe departments. We are still engaging them, especially with regard to assets. So once that matter is finalized, then uh, we will then release the remaining or when the matter is clarified and uh, a portfolio of evidence is provided. But uh, we are dealing with that matter. We have returned to the specific NPO that you are referring to um, so that we can engage further on this matter. So that's how we're dealing with it because we're trying to avoid a situation where uh, the retention fee is given and then later we are we find ourselves uh, that uh, some NPOs they still owe the department. More especially that uh, the, um, the, the, the 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 contract of some the contract will come to the end of of, of of number of NPOs next year. So we're making sure that we do uh, due diligence now, and even those who who, who have not given who have not uh, received retention fee, we make sure that everything is is according to the books. That's how it is, uh, Chair, with regard to Seriti and others. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sisana. Mbulelo dealt with the issue of the forward by the Deputy Minister DG. There's a question that remains unanswered that has to deal with the previous discussion with the committee in the committee regarding the alternative intervention to support municipalities that are failing to spend their equitable share. Because the concern of the members is that though you withhold or offset but then it's the people that are suffering. It's penalizing them because they can't get the services. So we wanted to understand whether the department is a, considered that the, and reflected on these issues as raised. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, yes, the department uh, is and has been reflecting on, on this issue. Uh, we've also had some uh, discussions uh, specifically around this issue when in preparation for the budget, uh, uh, that's upcoming. Uh, so yes, we have to put it on, on a chair. Whether we have the right answers at this particular point, uh, I would say that this is a work in progress. Uh, and if Mela would like to also add to the, the response around this is welcome to, but this is where we are at as a department on this matter. Thank you, Chair. Maybe I'll Can add we... something, uh, Chair. Okay, before you, Minister, can we get clarity from Mr. Foss? Regional and urban development, I suppose, in terms of what you put in your annual report is program two. And you did, did you foresee you are responsible for program five? I'm reading from your annual report where in you are saying as the department you are intending to incorporate DDM under the urban development program, which According to your own agonogram, as it's here in the annual report, it has no DDG. So that was the issue all about that. You see, this uh, urban, regional and urban development program has not been having a DDG. So that was the issue around that. And then that's what the annual report is saying that you are intending to incorporate, though you've provided clarity that that has been the minister's call that each and every DDG must then embrace district development mode. But this is what is in your own annual report. The question was about that a, a, a DDG 4C. Yeah, 
Uh, thanks, Chair. No, you 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 are correct, Chair. Uh, for me to be precise, if you are to look, it's on page 24. I was still looking for the page, the annual report. It's on page 24 of your annual report. You look that on the agonogram, you see what I'm talking about. Yes. Yeah, no, Chair, I, I should have explained or understood maybe the question. Uh, so, so when uh, Treasury introduced the budget cards, uh, I think in 2015, 16, something, uh, there was an idea of creating a branch, uh, but uh, with the budget cards, we were not able to, to fill that. Uh, so that program and, and program five were basically merged into one. So we've only managed to actually have one budget uh, sort of uh, structure, operational in the budget structure now, which is one. So the two now won't be appearing uh, going forward as two sort of uh, programs. They, they will be merged into one. But, but you correct, Chair, yeah, thanks. Uh, I just didn't get the question in terms of that context. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, Minister. Minister. Thank you. Your hand is up. Yes, thank you, Chair. I was just going to add on the issue of the municipalities that are not able to spend all their grant uh, money. We've had a discussion with the Minister of Finance in this matter. And before the, 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 the money was given to municipalities that are able to spend. So it was taken to the, from the poor to the richer municipalities or metros that are able to spend. But we've discussed this extensively to say that the, the people for whom that budget was allocated still need those services but the municipalities some of them are not able to spend because they are just too small they don't have planners they don't have engineers they don't have people who can assist them to actually plan for the project so that they can put the project on the market and it can be implemented so the minister of finance has agreed that that a practice must stop but of course, we have to then uh, assist, see how to assist the municipalities. But it is also linked to the division of revenue, which we are discussing, because some of those municipalities just don't have the revenue base. So they will never be able to attract the skills, the professional skills that are needed. Uh, to be able to, 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 to do projects. So we are discussing both matters. In the meantime, we've asked if MISA could also assist those municipalities. Some of the municipalities MISA was able to assist last year so that they can uh, spend their money better. But of course, MISA also has a limitation in terms of uh, its personnel. But it's a matter that we assist with, discussing with Treasury, and we hope that uh, <clears throat> we, 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 we can conclude it. And if you could also, where you can influence, influence, it would be helpful. Thank you. OK. Are you done, Minister? The hands that are on the, on the screen, Mkalib, is it a new end or is it an old end? Uh, no, no, on no. The... It was an old hand, but uh, Chairperson, I don't know why the Minister was so emotional about what I raised, because no one said to the Minister must withdraw. We're just correcting for the sake of the records to say that she can't be saying the new DG is the one who made the department to qualify on audit. The new DG was employed in April. 
so the processes of audit was already taking place. We are stating the facts, Chair. We must not distort facts here. So, but no one has said she must withdraw. I don't know why Minister was saying that I said him she must withdraw. I was just wanted to put on record because the meeting of Parliament are recorded to say that let us not distort effect. Thank you. Minister? Okay, I'm not distorting. The auditing work starts after. There was a lot of work that was done after the end of the financial year, leading to the report to the Auditor General. But even during that time, there was a lot of work that the information that the auditor, auditors needed. So it's not true that the DG didn't do anything when she arrived, everything was done. It's not true. Okay. Why are Zini? Yo. I suppose we are done with the meeting for the day. I respect you very much, but don't be personal. I have a right to raise concerns here in this committee. I'm a member of this committee. If you know when I'm a Wednesday general minister, can we, can we, can we? Anyway, you have to be personal. Say what we need because we are implying what is Kashumutonga Zilito. I'm saying when you need. employed her, she was employed in April. You can't be saying the 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 the, 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 the what the, the department have achieved must also be go to her. So don't come here, Minister, and distort fact. That's what I'm pleading to you. Just give her time. We are here to support her as the DG of the department, but we must not talk something that is not a fact in this committee. We are, we are just correcting that fact. Unfortunately, it is a fact. Uh, it the is a fact. Yeah, maybe is somewhere else, but not in the department. Can we, can we stop no, no, the dialogue? No. Let me tell you. With the meeting. Can we stop the dialogue between no, you uh, on the Republican? The, the, the financial end ends in March. The, end, the financial year ends in March. And the process, the auditing takes place thereafter. It doesn't take place during the year. Yes, they can be a, a spot auditing or whatever, but the, the, the heavy lifting of auditing takes place at the close of the financial year. It's a fact. Editor General, can you respond to the issue of the CWP audits and the exemption for supply chain management? If I may ask you to do that okay. now. Yes, that's fine. Um, as asked by the honourable members um, to go into more detail, I think we also addressed this in, in, in the presentation, but I will just give a bit more facts behind it. So when the department originally entered into the um, new contract with the MPOs, it was um, on the premise of a transfer. And at that point, um, the competitive bidding process was not followed when appointing the new implementing agents. Um, Treasury then came back to the department after various submissions by the department to state that Circular 21 is at play. And that that means that the department would have to account for this, not as a transfer, but as goods and services. So that created this conundrum situation where you don't, you, you, you have this sort of hybrid where it was a transfer in legal terms with the MPOs, but in the terms of accounting, the department had to account for the goods and services. So the problem of this thing stemmed right immediately from the start of the procurement process, which then presented a problem for the department as Treasury 
from their point of view, he'll advise them um, regionally. So then submission letters were sent to Treasury. And at that point in time, um, Treasury came back and said, and they set up a meeting between us and the department and themselves um, and said that we cannot really challenge their authority, which was true. This has been confirmed by our office as well, but that they concur, they stick to their guns that this will be accounted for in terms of um, circular 21 as goods and services, but they would grant the department a departure in terms of section 79 of the PFMA, which then basically departs from the whole process of supply chain. So that's where we are now. And the department will account for the transactions with the MPOs as goods and services, but they will not be held accountable for any supply chain um, deviations within the process. So that's we, why we are not, a, we are not in, they can't incur any regular that relates to this because they can't incur any non-compliance. That's why they can also not incur any other non-compliance, be it local content, be it 30-day payments, be it um, employees of the state in, within this payments to the CWP program. Um, and that's why we are reiterating that this is a three-year departure granted by Treasury. And this comes to an end uh, 2021, next year, March. It will not be an issue in the next audit cycle because for the next audit cycle, it will be 2021 that we're auditing. But after that, that's when the problem becomes um, effective. And as we've now also discussed earlier, um, the model is not on the table yet. So, um, and I know that the members also brought this under the attention of us and the department to say that there was a discussion around this. Um, and that's where we, we are a bit of concern is that if the model is not decided upon yet, um, come next year and there's nothing on the table, the department wouldn't have a choice to carry on with the contract in its current form and state. And that's when irregular will start being incurred at massive amounts relating to the um, payments to these implementing agents in terms of the service that they provide to the department. Thank you. Thank you. Apologies. Uh, thank you, Tim AG. Chair. Yes, Adele. No, no, th thanks, Chair. I, 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 I wanted to interject earlier on uh, to say, I think in, in this committee, we have been working uh, uh, fine all along, but we also need to uh, uh, protect the minister um, and, and, and her executive authority, the manner in which the few minutes issues have um, unfolded, it's an unfortunate chair. I think if we don't like the response from the minister, we just have to accept it, but uh, we need to really accord her the respect that she deserves and, and the protection that she deserves. We're not saying um, ministers and deputy ministers must be protected, but in the manner in which we conduct ourselves, at least um, how we have started as this committee, we should maintain it. Um, it's quite unfortunate, uh, the to and from, uh, but in essence, all I'm appealing is that let us accord our minister the respect that she deserves. Thank you. We might not agree with her in, in, in some of the issues. Uh, we also differ with her, but let's, let us do that in, in the manner in which that is befitting of her position. Thank you. Chair. Point noted. Honorable Mukhadi. What is Peggy saying, if I can get a clarity? Is she is he suggesting that we must not speak here in this committee? What is no, he I'm, saying actually? I'm, I'm saying who is uh, respected who here? For a person, Maybe this is can, I, can I respond? Hey, hey, wait. I didn't disturb you when you were talking. Can you stop your dialogue, colleagues, please? You are making yeah. my life a really bit difficult. Speak to yeah. me, the chair. If you can't address this thing of Peggy is coming with now, 
is going to be very difficult for you as the chairperson because what I know, Peggy is a member of this committee. I'm the member of this committee. No one can tell me how to speak in this committee. So the minister, if it's here, she's here to be engaged and no one must come here and pretend and behave as if he, she or he is the principal of this committee. We respect one another, but it does not mean that we must not have a robust debate in this committee. So what is she, he is saying is out of order as well. Uh, Honorable Chair, can I just repeat what I've said? I've said, let us accord each other respect. When a minister is speaking and whoever, even the member, you can't interject and uh, uh, want your views to be heard and raise your voice and saying others are distorting the facts. You are entitled to your opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. It's not what you say, but it's how you say it that matters. We're equally Chair capable Chair of becoming arrogant, but we're not going to do that. Chairperson we're Peggy, requesting it nicely. Chairperson Peggy is not my whip, and he must know that he is not going to tell me how to speak in this committee. The, the minute he knows that he's not my whip, he's not, I'm not going to be told by him how to speak in this committee. Uguti, how I speak is none of his business. We're asking you to accord each other respect. We are asking as who? You are asking as, you are asking as, as, as You must a ask your committee members, community. not me. I'm not going to be asked by you here. I'm not going to, to be told by you, Peggy, how to conduct myself in this committee. I've, I'm exactly to speak the way I want to speak. I'm not representing you here in this committee. I, I think I've made myself very clear. I, I, I repeat, it's not what you say, it's how you say that matters. It does not matter. I don't dictate on how you speak as well. So don't come and dictate to me. I'm not dictating. I'm not I'm dictating. I'm not expecting you to no, tell me how to speak I in this not, committee. I you are not my whip. Colleagues, colleagues. You are not I a whip of this committee. You are not Honorable a whip of this committee. And I'm not Mkali. going to be told by you. Honorable Mkaliki. Honorable Hadebe, yes, can you sure. stop this dialogue that you are taking between two? Let's come back to the issue that I should think, given the response from the from the AG, I think we need to have a, 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 the, the Treasury to come and account to us with regard to the deviation from Section uh, 79, uh, your departure, then it also seems like it's a subjective matter. But I think when we come back in the next year, we are going to then engage with Treasury. The other issue, as we want to close this meeting, there was an issue that the AG has raised around the the, the money that was paid to a private individual in the name of Sikukune instead of Sikukune district uh, municipality. I don't, didn't see anywhere in the presentation because we dealt with this earlier uh, this year, this matter, it was reported to us. I think it's the time when we're dealing with the investigations. Can we be updated on the status of that matter? whether monies have been recovered or it only ended on the CFO resigning at the processes to recover the money to, because I think it's around 183 million, if I'm not mistaken, are the processes that the department has embarked on in recovering the money? Thank you, Chairperson. Um, yes, there are processes that the department has embarked upon uh, to recover the money, Chairperson. What kind but of processes are those ones? Progress, Chairperson. What is the status of the matter? The status is, Chair, that uh, we believe that we will be able to recover around 52 million of the, the total amount that is, uh, that is uh, outstanding. Uh, but as I'm saying, Chair, we are still in process. 
I'm raising this DG because when we dealt with this matter earlier in March, it was in progress. That's why I'm asking what is the progress thus far? We dealt with this matter in March. Can are you able to give us a, a separate progress report to that effect, like what Dr. Sisana said on the status of the matter? On the other matters. Yes, Chairperson, we can provide a separate report. Sorry. Yeah, I should think then we need to end this meeting. Yeah, we are going to meet tomorrow, colleagues, after plenary for the other meetings. I hope tomorrow the network will be much better. We have lost a lot of members about the, because of the network. Yeah, a lot of them couldn't. Uh, let's adjourn this meeting and then I want to, to thank you for attending the meeting and also raise my concern on how this meeting has degenerated, but I think we'll be able to discuss it moving forward as the colleagues. Then the meeting gets adjourned till we meet tomorrow. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Chair. We remain resolute and unshaken. And thank Good you, night, Chair. Chair. Funipo so look. Well, I got Funipo so in. Thank you, Chair. If they look better in our meeting, please, man, Kali, what's your problem? No. You want to pause so in. Go to school, man. Thank you. I'm going to deal with you. I'm going to deal with you when I'm fine. I'm telling you. Okay, Mama, no, I could.